at the end of the day, we have this set of circumstances where the Fed is intent on reining in the labor situation. The higher that prices remain, that's going to force the Fed to raise rates higher and potentially keep rates higher for a longer period of time. We're expecting just a 25 basis point rate hike and think the Fed might even be able to pause from there. We're kind of moving totally out of the inflation regime. We're moving into something new. Disinflation in the second half of the year will kind of filter through into core and the picture will look very, very different. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Waiting for inflation data in America. Waiting. CPI Thursday just around the corner. Tom, you excited? It's not CPI Thursday. Sam Goldfarb over the Wall Street Journal nails it. It's super core CPI it's Thursday. Super core. super core. CPI Thursday. This is where Chairman Powell is and a lot of other people's services. X housing, maybe services, yeah. X housing, access. David Rosenberg's rolling over in his grave up in Canada saying you don't disassemble inflation. It's a sum of all these different parts. We'll do that tomorrow. I'm not sure that branding's going to work. Live from New York City super this core. morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience <clears> worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Lisa Bramitz is off for a couple of days. Bramitz is going to be back with us on Monday. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, positive two tenths of one percent. TK, the gloom out there. Does the gloom stack up? with what we're seeing in this market. So I went through the numbers this morning. EM equities back in a bull market. Copper prices back through 9,000. European banks, Eurozone banks, Tom, are up more than 40% from the lows of last summer. Make Off sense of that. The mat of the gloom three weeks ago, I'll let you decide four and a half weeks ago, whatever it is, and you list all these different items we see on the Bloomberg terminal. We have an extension of co accommodation today, John, out a positive number, out to 0 0.06 standard deviations. All you need to know, that confirms all the good news you're talking about. Is it a conundrum for Chairman Powell and this Federal Huge, Reserve? massive conundrum. Does it? Conundrums Mike Gaten of Bank of America says it's not. This doesn't have to be a major problem. They shouldn't obsess over the oh. fact that this market's pricing in rate cuts. I, I agree, but I, I, you know, nobody cares about my opinion. I'm going to state that the accommodation we're seeing and the good news we're seeing here is something he can't deal with until he sees inflation break. We may see that tomorrow. We get that tomorrow morning. I have to say today, light on data, light on Fed speak. Maybe that's good news for many of you. Right now, let's whip through the price action. Equity futures up two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Yields come back in on a 10 year, down by about four or five basis points to 357.24. We've got to talk about foreign exchange in a moment, Tom. Euro dollar 107.48, yeah. up a tenth of one percent there. Just the renewed optimism of the last couple of days off the back of maybe that Goldman note suggests that we can escape recession in the Eurozone. Am I doing the brief? Would you like to do the I'm brief? I'm doing the brief. What's coming up? What have Folks, you got? Folks, here's the brief. It's a Farrell Keen brief. Bramo is so gone, <laughs> Gareth Bale retired. I'm sorry, John. Kick the ball from outside. I don't know anything about soccer. I love this guy. He's like Graylish. They just make things happen. Early 30s, very young to retire. Very, very young to retire. Bad knees like Bobby Orr? No, I think he's fed up with the game and wants to play golf. That would be my personal opinion on the matter. I yep. don't think he was well respected at Real Madrid, despite how much he won there. That, yeah, that was Wasn't the, loved by the fans at all. Oliver Brown in the Telegraph, I read every word, and that's what he said. Ugly fell out with the club, and it looks Why like he got he bored go of football. Why can't he go back to Tots and play seven minutes? Well, he did play for Tottenham for a little bit, didn't well, he? Come he went back. back there. Yeah, come back. I don't think that's what Antonio Conte is looking for right now. We've never had a brief like this. That this this happens sometimes. Sometimes players just kind of leave. Do you remember Zidane walking away from? From yes, football I liked after him. the 2006 no World Cup. And he didn't so, get along with Bale, I read. Just a beautiful player. When he coached the team. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't think we were doing this today. This is a brief. That's the brief. It's a surveillance I'm not brief. Sure. I'm not sure. Brief this morning. <laughs> That's not cheers. the brief. Cheers, right there, John. Not, not the brief that Bramo would approve of. Don't but spill I'll, that in my tang. Okay. Oh, cheers. There we just go. Delicately cheers. over the Bloomberg go. terminal. Vasilios Janakis joins us now, head of European FX strategy at City. Vasilios, let's talk about that. In the face of all this global recession talk, the market's having a different conversation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think to a certain extent, uh, these. Um, forecasts about the uh, recession um, are a bit uh, outdated and they're based on a number of forecasts that were produced back in Q3 and beginning of Q4. This is not to say that uh, there are not going to be a number of economies that are going to experience a sharp slowdown or even a recession, the UK being uh, one of them. Uh, but I think uh, there's been a significant, a massive change in the market narrative in, in Q4. The initial headlines about um, um, China reopening morphed 
uh, into concrete and very quick and swift action. Uh, there's been further support in uh, the housing sector in, in China. And I think what we're currently seeing is that this uh, drastic mindset, a uh, change in mindset, which caught me by surprise as well, um, uh, to support growth in China uh, is basically uh, shifting the focus of the market into a re-rating of global growth expectations higher. And I think this is precisely what um, you know equities are telling us. This is what relative equity performance is telling us. And that's definitely what the dollar market is telling us. Well, let's push it through the FX market. The peak of the US dollar was late September, the low in euro dollar around the same time. That low on the euro was about 95, 95 cents on euro dollar. Right now, we're back to 107.50. What kind of upside are you thinking about on a single currency now, Vasilios? Well, I think right now we're at very uh, critical levels. Um, uh, I think uh, 107.80 is going to be a level uh, that has proved to be in the past uh, quite a, a strong uh, um, uh, resistance area. If we clear that level, obviously we're going to see uh, a lot of leverage money uh, buying into further upside. And potentially this is going to imply that real money accounts are also going to follow through. Uh, but then again, fundamentally, uh, you know, you, you have to take a step back and say, what do our fundamental models suggest, fair value models suggest? And I think right now we're gravitating towards a fair value range of 112 to 115. Clearly, we're still pricing a risk premium because of the Fed, because of right. uh, we're not certain how the China reopening is going to pan out. Um, but I have to say, I, first of all, I don't think that at 25 basis points repricing uh, higher or lower uh, in the Fed is neither here nor there for uh, the market and for the foreign exchange market. Uh, and assuming this and assuming that we get uh, a relatively smooth China reopening, which implies well, a pickup in domestic demand, and therefore Chinese and imports. Yes, I think we can gravitate towards this level. Uh, over the course of the right. next report. Vasilis, that's right where I wanted to go. And, and I'm, I'm talking about you and your great FX team, but also all of Citigroup and including Ed Morris's world-class call on oil last year. Are we fighting the last war? Are we fighting right now intellectually the 2022 war and that World Bank has China growing at four point whatever percent and Ed Hyman and Evercore ISI have China growing at 6.2%. It seems to me right now there's a whole... Not gloom crew and honor Bramo, but just a cautionary crew not modeling in the potential upside of 2023. Oh, absolutely. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, and uh, you know you know what? I think you're hitting the nail because a lot of, um, uh, of the uh, discussions I have been having with uh, especially U.S. clients, you know, if I measure the time that I spend about talking about the Fed, uh, it, take, it consumes about 65 to 70 percent uh, of our discussion. And that was the big market thing back in 2022. But since Q4, we have had a massive uh, shift in, in market narrative. It is pretty much all about China right now. And if this thing pans out uh, relatively smoothly, as I said, it will have hiccups, especially in Q1. Uh, which is going to represent, let's call it the trial period of how things <clears throat> are going in China, I think it can prove that um, uh, the change in the mindset in Beijing can actually bail out uh, global growth uh, and morph into an upside in global growth and upside in global trade as well. So is this the repeat of the post-financial crisis playbook for Sirius? Do you remember that when China bailed out, bailed out global growth? Is this a repeat of that? Uh, to a certain extent, it can be. Look, uh, I, I, I don't want to draw parallels with a great financial crisis. No, of course uh, not. Largely because we were hit by completely different shocks. Uh, back in the GFC, we were hit by an endogenous uh, shock. Uh, right now, we, are be we initially were hit by an exogenous shock, which was uh, COVID, uh, which started building, um, uh, you know, a lot of saving buffers and... Uh, uh, eventually um, uh, meant that uh, we had to deal with extremely high levels of inflation. Um, and um, during this time, during this past two years, China has been completely shut, or at least to a large extent, shut from the rest of the world. Uh, and all these bottlenecks, I think, they're going to start, um, you know, getting 
um, um, uh, release, they're going to start to uh, uh, become less of a hurdle uh, into the various uh, trade uh, chains and the trade channels. And, and I think this is a big positive for uh, global growth. Vasilios Janakis of City. It's brilliant. Vasilios, just Great fantastic. To Great to start. Over at City, a little bit more constructive <clears throat> on the outlook. When we talk about China, we've done this a few times on this program over the last several weeks. You've got to break it down just quite simply. Demand side questions, supply side questions. On the supply side, does it deliver supply side relief in the way that Vasilios expects it to? I... Or does it lead to further supply side dislocations off the back of that big demand that we're expecting? I'm going to go to uh, Jonathan Spence 101. They have one mandate within their totalitarian regime, and that is to marginally employ the people. And that means fiscal stimulus and particularly a bailout of their domestic real estate business. And that statistic yesterday from Julian Emanuel in the Hyman of 6.2% China CPI doesn't get you to the gloom of a good institution, World Bank. We've got mail pass coming up. I'm looking forward and to by it. by definition, they have to look back. I get that. Giannakis is looking forward and seeing uh, a better day. Malpass is looking at maybe a one handle on global GDP. The price action is not <clears throat> confirming that outlook That's in correct. any way, That's shape correct. or form. Yeah, I, I will always defend these institutions. They are institutions. They have to look backwards. And that's what I saw yesterday from World. I get all of that. So for an investor right now, you've got to answer a simple question, Tom. I've been asking it. Should you price in a global growth rebound off the back of China reopening, or should you price in a global growth slowdown off the back of monster financial tightening? You should tune into Bloomberg Surveillance tomorrow at 8.30, where we will look at super core inflation along with everyone else. And these are the drips, Spanish inflation, French inflation, three other inflations I can't remember, John. Even the United Kingdom with a warm Europe, maybe a better net gas pricing in Europe. These are cumulative good news is on disinflation. I'm with you, though. I think this conversation can completely change at 8.31 Eastern time tomorrow morning. Yeah. Completely. You get an upside surprise, the conversation switches, right. and Vasilis is going to be very John, upset. We are not de-emphasizing the inflation report tomorrow. We're not going to do that. We're not going to de-emphasize the inflation stuff. report. To Vasilis's point, his frustration about the conversation being dominated by the Fed, you get an upside surprise. 65% of tomorrow. his tech... It's all we're going to talk about. John, 65% of his chat is consumed, I say, consumed by Fed chat. That's almost as bad as you. So he thinks it should be 80% China? It's, it's 80% with you. You reckon? Yeah, Fed chat. I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring it back no, in. Grandma's. I'm trying to lean a little bit more into the China conversation, I agree. Tom. I agree. Equity futures Let's right now, up point. two tenths of 1% on the S&P. Let's round it up. Yields are down by four or five basis points. Your 10-year, 357. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden says he was surprised that classified documents were discovered in an office he used before he was elected. He says his lawyers did the right thing by calling the National Archives, which took possession of the papers the next day. Congressional Republicans are promising to investigate. The U.S. will bring Ukrainian soldiers to Oklahoma to train on the Patriot air defense system. About 90 to 100 Ukrainians will take part. Normally, training on the Patriot takes several months. But the U.S. is looking for ways to speed that up. In the U.K., ambulance workers are on strike again today. Members of the two unions are walking out as part of a dispute of pay in the National Health Service. The public's been warned they may have to wait longer for emergency services. Bloomberg's learned that Apple will start using its own custom displays in mobile devices as early as next year. That's a blow to partners such as Samsung and LG. The company plans to begin by swapping out the display in the highest end Apple watches by the end of 2024. And after years of scandals and multi-billion dollar losses, Credit Suisse is tightening its belt. Bloomberg has learned the Swiss lender is considering cutting the bonus pool for 2022 by about half. The move would bring the amount down to about $1 billion, with some employees likely to receive no bonus at all for last year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. People know I take classified uh, documents, classified information seriously. They found some documents in a box in a locked cabinet. 
or at least the closet. And as soon as they did, they realized there were several classified documents in that box. And they did what they should have done. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. But I don't know what's in the documents. The President of the United States just in a touch of hot water. We'll pick up on that in just a moment. Live from New York this morning. Good morning. About 25 hours, 26 hours away from a CPI report in America. The Fed speak pretty quiet today. The data pretty quiet as well. Your market pretty <coughs> quiet too. The equity market looks like this. Equity futures positive, a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields come back down by four or five basis points, 357.24. Crude, 75.42. Watch out for this a little bit later. We're up four tenths of 1% on WTI. Watch out for stockpile data a little bit later today, Tom, because some evidence perhaps that stockpiles have been climbing in yeah, America. Yeah, so that's one to watch for later. I agree. It's other than Zeitgeist. I got Brent crude rounded up to $81 a barrel. Even though the moves are small, John, I would say they continue the trend of accommodation, of optimism, of a constructive view forward. And I'd say this mostly, John, because the VIX was 21, 22, wouldn't move. And yesterday with a vengeance came into 20.75. At least that's a, a shift in this gentle trend. Never mind the VIX. Hello, Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs and copper prices over in London on the LME back through 9,000 for the first time, I think, since last summer. Well, so we're talking China? about how to express that China reopening story, <clears throat> pushing it yeah. through the FX market, pushing it through equities, pushing it through commodities and base metals, Tom, in a big way. We get a briefing now in Washington, the turmoil, the tumult that we all witnessed on the floor. Whatever your politics, it is a most interesting January in Washington. Greg Vellier is chief U.S. policy strategist at AGF Investments. And joins us now. Greg, there's like 14 ways to go here on your new Washington. But one has to be the quote unquote big bipartisan win for Speaker McCarthy on China. How big a win was that? I mean, we're going to go after China. Is that news? I think it was pretty clever, Tom. He knows there's great antipathy toward China in both parties. So he played on that, and he got a huge victory, bipartisan victory yesterday, creating a committee that's going to look at China stealing our intellectual property, trade violations, blah, blah, blah. But I do think he puts a lot of pressure on China, and he shows that he can get some votes from Democrats. Where else can he get votes from Democrats? Call me crazy, and many have, but I don't totally rule out an immigration deal. I, I don't think Biden would be a big player. His policies are incoherent, frankly, on the subject. But I think you've got a lot of people in both parties who would like to get something done. I don't totally rule that out. Greg, starting to see some restrictions come through from various places to restrict Chinese investment in real estate. See that in Canada with Trudeau making an effort there. Heard this yeah. morning in the last 24 hours that Governor DeSantis might make the same push over in Florida. You're going to see more of that. I think so. I, I, I think there, you go around the country and talk to business leaders and to a person, they will tell you that in competing with China, that China doesn't play fair, that they cheat, that they steal things. I'm not saying I believe it, but you hear it from everybody. So, uh, yeah, John, I think there's going to be more. And, of course, Trudeau got a smackdown from Xi uh, a month or so ago. <laughs> so the, the relations between North America and China are going to stay very rocky. Well, I think the tension there, Greg, is obvious, less obvious until recently has been the tension between the Europeans and the Americans over the investment around things like EVs. Greg, have we reconciled yeah. any differences over the last couple of weeks? Not really. I, I wrote this morning, I thought the summit in Mexico was a total dud, just platitudes, nothing really accomplished, uh, including no deal on EVs, which has a lot of countries upset. Uh, there's some big issues in Latin America, Brazil, Haiti, the wall with Mexico, yeah. but I thought this summit was, was useless. Greg, what did the progressives, the far left wing of the Democratic Party, what did they learn from the McCarthy speaker fiasco, what did they? What lessons were taken from the strength and negotiating power of the far right over yeah. by the far left? 
Uh, two things, Tom, quickly. Number one, some people in the Democrats' party, you know, feel that this gives them an opportunity to continue branding these uh, extremists as uh, a, a real uh, the enemy, and that might help them. But I, I think the bigger takeaway is that this is going to be a tough fight. It's going to be a nasty year. There's going to be hearings. I think there's a chance uh, Trump could get indicted later in uh, in Georgia, later in the month. It's going to be a really nasty year, and I think the Democrats got to wake up call by what they saw over the last weekend. We've had a nasty year. I'm going to go back to Alien Sedition Act, 1801, 1802. Yeah. Or this is normal in American politics. Scope and scale that back across our history. How nasty is nasty? Well, I mean, when when I started, I mean, you saw the, the fights over Vietnam and Watergate, and it's continued uh, to mm -hmm. go go on uh, beyond right. that. I mean, it, not to sound like a want, but it's about the fundamental role of government. Is right. it re a reduced role? Is it a big role? That's going to be dominant this year. Greg, on the front lawn of your house up in New Hampshire, you got a big, big <laughs> poster that says we're right. first in the nation. Help me with yeah. the primary fiasco here in New Hampshire, literally by, I believe, constitutional law, has to yeah. be first in the nation. Is this just silly politics or is there some substance here for our viewers and listeners? Oh, I think that there's real substance and that there'll be uh, a delay, in, and certainly in Iowa. I think they're going to get a delay, maybe New Hampshire as well. But knowing people in my home state, I think you'll probably see that as yeah. the first oh. primary. Greg, Already, yeah. lots of Democrats are on their way up, including Phil Murphy of New Jersey. Greg, can you see John Farrow at the Radisson Hotel <laughs> up there in right. Concord dressed head to toe in L.L. Bean? I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, it's just no. a, sight, a sight to behold. He lost me in not, Radisson, TK. <laughs> not, not unless there's room service, John, right? <laughs> <laughs> you tell him, Greg. Greg Vallier of AGF yeah. Investments. Hey, Greg, thank you. Developing okay. story right now in the United States of America. I want to build on that for you just briefly. This off the back of reporting from Reuters. So I'll bring you their story verbatim. The US Federal Aviation Administration system that alerts pilots and other flight personnel about hazards or any changes to airport facility services and relevant procedures was not processing updated information. The Civil Aviation Regulators website showed today over 400 flights were delayed within and into or out of the United States as of Wednesday, today at 5.31 Eastern Time, flight tracking website FlightAware showed it was not immediately clear if the outage was a factor. The information still coming through, Tom. That's the reporting that came from Reuters in the last 30 minutes or so. Yeah. If you're looking at the pre-market moves, the airlines are a little bit softer. No real drama here. We're down about a half of 1% on American. On United, down a third of 1%. Southwest, which has had its own troubles with its own systems over the last couple of weeks, is down 2.8%. You can make jokes about it, but it's not funny. There are airplanes in the air. There are international flights coming in. It's boom time, 6, 7, 8 a.m. on the East Coast for all those international flights to drop in. And, you know, I don't know the details of it, but these are busy skies just with what's up there now, even if they're grounded on the ground. When we get more information, we'll bring yeah. it to you. But that's the latest from the reporting from Reuters this morning. Elsewhere, the equity market is just a little bit firmer on the S&P 500, up by two-tenths of 1%. Futures advancing here. Your next big stop, your next schedule to stop for equity markets, the bond market, FX as well as CPI tomorrow morning. Equities up, going into it, Tom, yields lower by five basis points on a 10-year 357. Services and goods, goods near disinflation, even I've seen some charts drop, dropping down on the edge of deflation, a negative statistic on some of the good subsets, but services just hasn't given way. you got to come back down to a 3% normal. I'm using that as a very general statement, John, but you got to get services down, not to zero, not to 2% as a Fed statistic, but just some there on a blended basis with goods that moves them in the right direction. And we're just not there yet. We may get a vector, a trend that gets you there, but we're not there yet. In well, let's talk about the trend of last week. Headline data, claims exceptionally low. Payrolls, I, I, still pretty decent. Unemployment, 3.5%. Just that softness <clears throat> in wages, maybe that reduction in hours worked. Maybe that gets your attention some. Neil Dada, Jim Glassman, and the other optimists out there, they look, they look really smart going into a recession that's out there somewhere. Excited to catch up with Chris Verone, a strategist, very shortly from New York. This is Bloomberg. Coming off the back of a decent day of gains on the S&P 500 yesterday, having a look at building on them, equity futures up by a tenth or two, 
up by 0.16% on the S&P, up a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq. In the bond market, ahead of CPI tomorrow morning, yield to come back in by four or five basis points, 357, your two-year. 423.67 yields in there about a basis point. The optimism around Europe, you've heard it a million times in the last 24 hours, haven't you? All of a sudden from sub parity, 95, 0.95 at the end of September and back to 107.45 on euro dollar here, up about a tenth of 1%. Some stocks to watch in the pre market. I think we're all over the airlines right now. I'll go through some of the reporting out there at the moment. <coughs> Reuters first out this morning saying the US Federal Aviation Administration system that alerts pilots and other personnel about hazards or any changes to airport facility services services and relevant procedures was not processing updated information. The latest reporting from NBC News is that all flights in the U.S. have been grounded. I got a 400 number on after that, this roughly. FAA yeah. Outage, Tom. So we are down on American by about 1.6%, on Delta by three quarters of 1%, United, Tom, down a half of 1%, and Southwest, for all its own troubles, right. here's potentially some more. That stock's down by 2.8%. We aim to please, John, NOTAMS, N-O-T-A-M-S, Indicate real-time and abnormal status impacting every user. Concern the establishment, condition, and change of facilities, hazards, in the system. NOTAMs have a unique language using special contractions to make communication more efficient. This is the inside language of the FAA that's down. I just got a tweet from the FAA, Tom, so I'll share that with our audience as well. It reads as follows. The FAA is working to restore its notice-to-air mission systems. We are performing final validation checks and reloading the system now. Operations across the national airspace system are affected. We will provide frequent updates as we make progress. The latest, Tom, from the Federal Aviation Administration. We've got an iPhone. They're rebooting it. Sounds like what they're doing. We will continue to get off and back on a again. serious <laughs> matter, folks, with an estimated 400 flights by Reuters grounded right now. Not grounded is Chris Verone, partner, head of trend, technical and macro strategy at Baird. He and I are on the same page. Forget stochastics. Trend matters. Which trend chart, Chris Verone, right now matters? Well, Tom, it's a great question. And I think when you look at the market in totality right now, you could make two very compelling cases on both sides. Let's take what I think are some of the problems with the bull thesis right now. When you look at the problems to the bull trend, I would say it's gold has been better than stocks. The largest stock in the world, Apple, has broken down, and the yield curve is still wildly inverted. So that's the problem with the bull case. What's the problem with the bear case? The problem with the bear case is <laughs> Caterpillar is at a 52-week high, LVMH <laughs> is at a 52-week high, um, and industrials all over the world are breaking out. Right. So we're in this very, very right. disparate market. You know, 2022 was a monolith. I, I don't think 2023 is a monolith. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting here, Chris Verone, and you know under setups, you can have a number of trends to confirm. Does time yeah. heal the confirmation wound? Wound. If I've got a certain trend belief yeah. that I have, do I go out February, March, May to get confirming trend? Is that going to happen? Well, I think, Tom, I think to that question, I think the best trends or the bull markets out there are in what no one owns. It's metals and it's mining. I mean, look at the breakouts we've seen in Rio and BHP and Valet and Freeport, right? There's a message there. It's just a really small part of the market that I think is wildly underowned. And then conversely, when you look at the stuff that people do own still in size, relative top in Apple, relative top in Microsoft. So it's a very split tape from that perspective. The bull markets are in what no one owns right now. Well, let's go through it one by one. And, Chris, I want you yeah. to tell me what you'd sell. EM Equities back in a bull market. Copper back through 9K. You mentioned Rio. It's up almost 40% from its lows in late October. Look at the banks in Europe. They're up 42% from the July lows. You can look at high-yield spreads in the United States. It's not just the stuff abroad. High-yield spreads in the U.S. are the tightest we've seen yeah. going back to August. They're more than 100 basis points off the wides. What's a sell here, Chris, going through those things? Well... When I hear you describe that, John, I think what you're describing is money's coming home. Capital is being called home. For the last decade, you were really only rewarded if you parked money in the U.S., and there was a lot of various ways to do that. When I look at U.S. market cap as a share of total market cap, it's topped. It's declining. 
right? So there is a change where money is going back to where it originated from. You see that not just with the European banks, you see it with the Japanese banks. I mean, what's the message there? You see it in the strength in the Chinese yuan, right? So everywhere I look, you know, we've talked a lot about regime change now entering in its second year. Capital is being called home. I think that's a really, really important theme moving forward. So, Chris, let's build on it. What do you say to the people here in the United States with a home bias who think we're one rate cut away from tech regaining leadership and the U.S. beating the rest of the world? You know, I think um, all this focus on the pivot is missing the actual pivot. In the actual pivots, what happened in Japan in mid-December, the actual pivot, it's what's going on in China right now. I mean, look at the response to the equities or the corners of the market that are related to those stories. I mean, the move in the Japanese banks, you're talking about a decade-long breakout, a 20-year breakout in some of the Japanese banks. I mean, that is how a market should respond to a meaningful pivot. You've seen it in Japan. The move we're seeing... I think with these big basic resource stocks would also be suggestive of a major shift uh, in China right now. And then when I look at the U.S., all this anticipation for a pivot, and you have rates down and you have right. dollar down, and the big weights are still underperforming. So I think the market is speaking very clearly about what the real pivot is and what's the fallacy. Uh, Chris, it's Tigas Baird. If I want to express a belief in the recovery of China, maybe even Japan, in the Pacific Rim, how do you best express that? Do you do it through an ETF? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a couple ways. And, you know, we certainly run ETF strategies and that try to capture the macro thematic elements of, of uh, what's going on. But I would also just add to that, you know, the thing about China, I want to own something where I don't have to be perfectly correct on China. And that's why I like these big basic resource stocks. I think there's other stories there. I think the China reopen is part of it. But when I look at Rio or Valet or BHP or Glencore, I think there's more than just the China story there. So, you know, in emphasizing what are the best charts around the world, those are certainly high uh, on our list. Yeah, okay, they're certainly high on your list. Tell me about the tax. You say they're beleaguered, they're still overloved and all that. They've still got massive revenue growth. They're still... I believe going to have product, they're going to make, you know, the profitable ones are going to make margin. Do you ignore them or just hold them? I think you still sell them. Uh, we're in the, I think, still early innings of what will be a multi-year move out of these stocks. And Tom, it'll have two phases. And I think we probably have seen the first phase. And the first phase was these names going down more in a down market. But the second phase is almost more paralyzing. It's these stocks going up less when the market goes up, I mean, right. that was the lesson of 2001, 2002, 2003. You know, the big tech stocks went down more as the index fell, and then they went up less in the next bull market. Uh, that, I think, is so important to remember here. Chris, on the same day that we got a 52-week low on Caterpillar, that was the same day the dollar peaked. Now, Chris, I imagine yeah. you don't think that's a coincidence. What's driving what? Uh, I, I think uh, that is not... Uh, at all an accident, um, you know, the, the deflation of the dollar here or the, the popping of the dollar bubble, I think, is a very big story for 2023 and beyond. Now, in the short term, I would say dollar is very oversold here. It would not surprise me to see it bounce. We're going to put in what I would call in my world a right shoulder uh, in the dollar. I would be a seller of dollar strength. But think about it this way, John. Um, over the last, let's call it 12 weeks, Growth investors and growth stocks have gotten every single thing they've wanted. Rates down, dollar down, softer inflation, and they have nothing to show for it. Right? Gold is up more than the triple Qs over the last 12 weeks. So that's a problem, I think, if you're counting on some change in the macro or some relief in the macro to be the catalyst for the um, restarting of the growth bull market. Hey, Chris, this was great. Chris Verone there, great brief. Strategus. Just looking Thank at those you. charts, and Chris, I have to say, mentioned those miners before the new year. It's not just this yeah. new thing, it's just look yeah. at the chart right yeah. now. It's been on the top of that story for the last several months. Is We've got a new headline. Just want to bring it to our audience, yeah, Tom. Please. United Airlines, yeah. 
The flights are grounded amid this FAA yeah. alert system failure. That headline crossed in time just moments ago. Thanks for your concern about Bramo. I just went, uh, you know, she's in Morristown. I thought she was at Teterboro, but she's at Morristown with the Gulf Stream. Is she trying to travel this morning? Private jets are on the ground, too. She can't get off. You know, you know, it's just, it's, it's there. United, we're going to hear from a lot of others as well. And what's important here, folks, is I don't have within the zeitgeist any indication of the duration of this. Do you, John? No what idea. I don't no think we've got any indication of that either. It could be 10 either. minutes. It could be whatever. All we know so Speculate. far is that there has been a failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the Federal Aviation Administration. NBC a little bit earlier this morning reported that all flights have been grounded. We're going to company after company and waiting for confirmation of that. But United Airlines and those flights have been grounded amid this FAA alert system failure. You can see the moves in the stocks in a pre-market. There's no real drama right now. We're down by 1.6% on American. On United, we're down a half of 1% on Southwest, as I keep saying, which has its own problems. And here's a new problem. Southwest is down by 2.5%. And to your point, Tom, a lot of this is going to depend on how long this goes on for. Yeah, and, and it's software. I mean, we're tied into the system and all. What I would suggest is not the danger. I don't want to over-accentuate it, but all the flights that are in the air. I don't have that statistic right now. How many flights, when this occurred, are in the no, air no across idea. America? And the answer is a big number. As you know, this big is a number. very risk-averse business, Yeah. as you know. So when we get more information, we'll bring it to you. But right now, that's the latest from United. Yeah. Flights grounded amid the FAA alert system failure, and the stock's a little bit softer. So if you are looking at travelling this morning... No doubt reach out to your red line and work out what on earth is going on this morning because I don't think a lot is going on, Tom, based on what we've seen so far. Well, we're just going to have to see. What I would suggest is there's still an airline boom. All the summary I have is no one that's expert in this is talking about an end of the boom. The one area is domestic business travel maybe hasn't come back like it should have. But other than that, it's. would you agree with me, John? Oh, transatlantic, international, taken, business, it's huge. Taken. Elaine Beck has talked about it with us a million yeah. times. Fantastic. Um, the outlook for this year was was pretty great yeah. for some of these airlines still. But the stocks really haven't come back. I mean, they've come back off the gloom of the pandemic, but they got, you know, there's a lot of people out there with some real enthusiasm about people like United. Developing story, as I say, we keep building it. The latest headline from United, flights grounded amid that FAA alert system failure. Coming up next... Freya Beamish, Chief Economist at T.S. Lombard, off the back of this monster China reopening story. We keep asking, should you be pricing in a growth rebound off the back of China reopening or a growth slowdown off the back of monster rate hikes over the last 12 months? Which one is it? From New York, this is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo well as you just heard flights across the u.s being disrupted this morning because of the failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the faa now there's no estimate for how long it will take to restore that system and scores of passengers due to fly domestically they're reporting delays all across social media in california more drenching rain is on the way as a historic drought gives way to flooding Three more storms are set to hit the state through the weekend. Since the end of December, storms have killed at least 15 people and closed highways and sent residents fleeing for their lives. Fixed income manager Jeffrey Gunlock says if investors want to know where interest rates are headed, don't pay attention to the Fed. Instead, he says they should look at the bond market. Fed officials indicate they expect to lift rates to more than 5%, but markets suggest the peak will be less than that. Wells Fargo has announced a new strategic direction for a mortgage empire that once was the largest in U.S. banking. It will stop funding home loans arranged by outsiders and shrink the portfolio of debts it services. That caps years of efforts to clean up a business that entangled Wells Fargo in regulatory probes and lawsuits. And shares of luxury goods company LVMH hit a record high today. The company named new CEOs at two of its brands, Louis Vuitton and Christian Dior. Now, the Dior chief is Delphine Arnaud. She's the daughter of LVMH CEO Bernard Arnaud. LVMH is already up 13% this year. Global news 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
when you see that the gas prices are going down, you can expect that the, the consumer bills are going to go down. But that indeed is the key thing because that's what is driving inflation. Uh, that inflation that is driving up, especially in countries with automatic indexation such as Belgium is driving the wages up, which is actually hampering our competitiveness. And, and so um, prices going down is good, but it will take some months before the consumer will see it. We're not out of the woods yet, is the message from the Belgian Prime Minister sitting down with Maria Tadeo in the last 24 hours. If you are just tuning in, good morning to you. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P through much of this morning. Equity futures right now look a little something like this, up three-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields come in four or five basis points on a 10-year to 357.24. If you can bring up the airline stocks... That's getting a ton of attention this morning. Here they are in the pre-market. Southwest down 2.5%. United down by a little more than 1% this morning. United Airlines temporarily grounding all flights to all destinations. Off the back of this story, Tom, that developed in the last hour, the failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the Federal Aviation Administration. It's going to take a long time, Tom, to work out what's going on here, but we haven't got the information yeah. yet as to how long this might take. We're learning about this in real time. We're not any smarter than you are, folks. And you know, I know you're going to go to our reporter on this, John, in uh, London. But just one sentence. This is from the FAA. Did you know that you should always check 25 nautical miles to either side of your full route? a flight to ensure relevant no tams that's how tight this is there's six jets up there at 35,000 feet or whatever and up and down you know whatever it is and they're looking at it with a 25 mile perspective that what does that's what doesn't work right now according to the latest reporting the FAA said on its website a hotline has been activated so this one's going to be a busy morning maybe the morning that some of you out there didn't want, if you're looking to travel this morning, stay side. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Siddharth Phillips. Sid, I want to just start with your latest reporting and what you've learned in the last hour. So, yeah, in the last hour, we've learned that United Airlines has temporarily grounded all its flights to all its destinations. And that's because of a, the failure of the key pilot system that is basically called the NOTAM or Notice to Air Mission System, which basically conveys important and urgent information that are essential for flight operations. So the NOTAM system is basically what keeps pilots informed about any abnormal sort of changes along the route, and it's crucial for safety and operators, operating flights safely. And from what the FAA has put out on its website, uh, the system failed at about 28, 20, 2028 last night, and since then there's been no new NOTAMs or amendments that have been processed. And the FAA hasn't really given us a time frame on when it plans to restore the system. It says technicians are working to restore it, but there's no there's no estimate for when that might actually happen. And they've activated a hotline to sort of um, to mitigate against this at the moment. Is it how unusual is this? Do we have any experience with this kind of thing shutting down? It is fairly un it is very unusual for a system shutting down. And again. It, it is crucial for airline operations, so getting it back up and running again is absolutely essential for right. pilots to be able to safely take off and land planes. Sid, you've got great experience in this, both in the United States and based out of London, running all of our aerospace coverage. And I'm absolutely fascinated by when I'm on the Heathrow flight path then and I'm over Fulham, and, you know, I get that there's all the rules of the United Kingdom, but the answer is... I'm seeing airplanes out there all over the place. Do you assume as a pro that the U.S. system of NOTAM is superior to Europe? Is Europe superior to America? Or is it all the same one big computer thing? Uh, it's all many little computers, but essentially it is the same safety system. And it's, the NOTAM system is common across the world. Every sort of uh, aviation regulator operates them across the world. In Europe, EASA runs them. So it is something that's crucial across the board, and I don't think there's any system that's superior to the other. But, I mean, this one is definitely a massive blow to the U.S. at the moment, and I'm sure there will be some sort of investigation as to what went wrong. Yeah. Hey, Sid, great to catch up, and if you get any more information, bring it to us. Sid, our Philip there of Bloomberg, thank you. No estimate on when the FAA there will restore go. services, Tom. All flights in the United States appear to be grounded at the moment.
Well, we're going to see. We're going to continue on with our coverage, and we'll let you know about any of the headlines here that we see from George Ferguson, from Mary Schlangenstein, and the rest of our aerospace uh, team in the United States. This is a very important conversation and becomes ever more important with the surveillance news flow of the last two days. There are beginning to be estimates of a China recovery. Freya Beamish is chief economist at T.S. Lombard in his borderline encyclopedic on the Chinese economic experience. She joins us this morning. Evercore ISI Freya floored us yesterday with a 6.2% recovery statistic for China GDP. Can you get there at T.S. Lombard? Not, not quite to that extent. We, we do think that growth this year will be in the 5% range, um, which I think is still a little bit above consensus. But we have to be really careful there what we mean by consensus, because our estimates are coming off a lower base for this year. So the official statistics are not really telling you the full details right. of, of how weak growth is this year. We had contraction, uh, and we're probably going to have another Q on Q contraction in, in Q4. So we get above 5% next year purely because of the, um, the, the timing of the reopening uh, and because of the low base last year. Um, but I, I think kind of taking a step back here and, and, and recognizing that this reopening trade has has got some steam behind it is, is, a, is a decent thing. Um, especially when you take into account the, the right. how low um, interest rates are in, in China. And that means that the retail investors right. will get in on it. They have space to, to leverage up and, and kind of buy right. into this trade. And again, to sell your expertise, how does that new growth in China, that recovery diffuse across the Pacific Rim and indeed over to America and on to Europe? So this, this China is really the risk in a number of different ways to the global story um, because it has decoupled from the shorter term story um, of of the, the the reopening that China is having that much later than than other other markets. Um, and then also because the secular story in China is at odds with the with the the secular story um, in the rest of the world, almost in a zero sum type of way. So to the to the short term story, uh, the the biggest kind of un, underappreciated risk that emanates from China is just that we have um, continued worries of supply disruptions in the in the short term while uh, while COVID is still um, running raging through the raging through the population, um, and that would be a very serious thing if it were to it, it were to cause um, the the price of of core goods to start rising again. All of our forecasts, and I'm sure those of others. Um, are, are based on on the idea that the price of core goods is going to be flat or falling, um, and that's what gets you to a kind of three percent or or four percent um, quarterly uh, three month annualized rate of core inflation in the U.S. CPI case by by Q2 of next year. And and markets are, I think are priced off of that. So if we start to get supply disruption and and, and the price of core goods um, fails to fall or stay flat, then that's that's a problem. That's not our base case at the moment, but it's a significant risk. When you actually get to the reopening itself, I think that will prove to be disappointing. By all means now, go for the tactical story. But in when, when you get the data coming through uh, in the middle of the year, uh, and certainly towards the end of the year, I think A, that the, the reopening itself will be, be disappointing, yeah. um, and B, that the, the structural slowdown will then start to make itself apparent further down the line. I've got 60 seconds on a clock. I want to squeeze this in. Just on the supply side, can I nail you down, nail you down to understand your base case and the sequencing of it? Are you seeing further supply side dislocations off the back of this China reopening before we see supply side relief? It's not our base case at this stage, but I'm just very aware that my own forecasts are extremely dependent on that core price, the, the price of core goods um, staying flat in, in the CPI in, in, um, in developed markets. So uh, if, if there was disruption to that, then that would be a problem. And I think if, if we get the, the actual numbers coming through on the, on the GDP side in the middle of the year, that'll be disappointing. Um, because the, the the consumer is is uh, is not doesn't have the kind of firepower behind it that the developed market consumers do, and because the property market the the stru structural answers have not been uh, provided by the authorities on on how the property market problems are going to be solved, and therefore all of this this kind of jubilance over um, the commodities, the hard commodities that normally rally with with China, yep. fine, play it for now, but when you get to the hard data, just be a bit more careful. Seeing that in copper right now. Freya Beamish of TS Lombard. Freya, thank you. 
TK, it's got to be the story of 2023, looking at a year ahead, China reopening. I, I, yes, I do agree with that. The focus is on inflation on a global basis in each tea leaf, but on an aggregate basis, there is no other story. Coming up, the brilliant Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. We'll catch up with him in the next hour. At the end of the day, we have this set of circumstances where the Fed is intent on reining in the labor situation. The higher that prices remain, that's going to force the Fed to raise rates higher and potentially keep rates higher for a longer period of time. We're expecting just a 25 basis point rate hike and think the Fed might even be able to pause from there. We're kind of moving totally out of the inflation regime. We're moving into something new. This inflation in the second half of the year will kind of filter through into core and the picture will look very, very different. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. A busier morning than we expected. Live yes. from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your latest news on the flying front in the United States of America, not much of it going on. The Federal Aviation Administration, a key pilot notification system operated by the FAA, disrupted air travel across the country this morning with United Airlines temporarily grounding flights to all destinations. The latest update that we're getting this morning from the FAA reads as follows out on Twitter. Cleared update number two for all stakeholders. The FAA is still working to fully restore the notice to air mission system following an outage. They go on to say, Tom, while some functions are beginning to come back online, national airspace system operations remain limited. The stocks of those airlines here in the United States through much of this morning in the pre-market. TK, just a little bit softer, but no real drama so far. Yeah, the drama here is, is the uncertainty, and I'm getting a lot of different numbers here. I really don't even want to quote how many flights are delayed. You know, all, all media ballet, this in, developing story. You know what? It's down. <laughs> That's a developing story. It's not working. And if you're at the airport, you're miserable. Maybe you're not miserable like over the holiday season and the disaster at Southwest and, and other airlines to be fair, but the answer is this is serious, and it has to do with the logistical structure of, of the integrity of the country. Flights granted, to your point a little bit earlier, you asked the question, how long is it going to go on for? Absolutely no idea. Yeah. I can only bring you the latest We're update from the, the FAA. Hysteria. Should we stand in the water in the ocean? We're in the... Is, is that what you're going to do? Yeah, go to the airport. Oh, like know, a storm report. Storm report. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. The We're FAA do just that. moments ago, just to repeat what they said, while some functions are beginning to come back online, national airspace system operations remain limited. Again, I get the information. I'll bring it to you. That's the latest. Tom, we also need to talk about what's happened to this market. Just a return of optimism. We closed out 22. Stunning Doom, yesterday. gloom, global recession calls. And we'll catch up with David Malpass at the World Bank a little bit later this morning, who has a one handle on global GDP growth. And I have to say, that one handle on global GDP growth is not captured <clears> in many of these markets right now. And what's important to remember is Malpass was the optimist. He was on the edge of Neil Dutta when he was at Bear Stearns. So for him to deliver a sub 2% statistic is just congenitally painful for uh, Mr. Mr. Malpass. What I see is a follow through here, John, and my headline off the data uh, yesterday was finally the equity market really nudged through with the VIX coming from a 22 handle down to 20.75. That's like halfway to maybe where it ought to be right now, given the oomph we're seeing in the market. Chairman Powell didn't say much. We're light on Fed speak today. Yeah, we're light on economic data today. Maybe like us, he wanted to wait for CPI. It's just possible. Morning. Inflation data just around the When's corner. When do you see it? You think he's well, I don't actually know the answer to that. I might ask Mike the key there. Maybe he's like up at Ben's Chili Bowl up on U he's just, Street. You think he's sitting there? I don't think there's a I secret, think secret envelope in public in the restaurant. At least he shouldn't be doing that. Ed Yardeni joins us now of Yardeni Research, the president and founder. Ed, can we start in this international story? Just start there. Just go a little bit deeper. Yeah. What do you make of it? Just the rally we're seeing in EM, in base metals, in copper and elsewhere too. Well, last year uh, there was uh, a lot of talk about a recession uh, around the world. Um, we started out last year with a lot of concern that 
uh, if the Fed was in fact going to tighten and inflation was going to be persistent, uh, that uh, the U.S. might fall into recession. And there was a lot of chatter in the first half of the year when real GDP was down. But um, there was also a lot of talk about uh, Europe going into a recession because of the war in Ukraine and what that did to energy supplies in Europe. And then, of course, China has been struggling with another wave of the pandemic. So you put it all together and uh, the outlook was uh, for last year for the global economy to be weak. Uh, now I think there's uh, the markets are s s signaling that uh, the plunge in natural gas prices uh, in, in Europe suggests that Europe may not have a recession after all. And now with uh, China abandoning the, uh, uh, the, the, the COVID policy, uh, opening up, uh, there's a perception that uh, we may get a terrible wave of the pandemic for a few months, but then it should abate and China should open. So the outlook for the world economy, I think, is actually improving. So, Ed, are these trends you want to ride? The rally we're seeing in EM equities, the rally we're seeing in the miners in base metals. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, especially since uh, we started out the year or ended up last year with uh, sort of a consensus view that the market was going to go down and make a new low. The stock market in the U.S. would make a, a new low by the middle of the year and then would provide opportunities uh, I think we made a low on October 12th uh, in the market. I think that was the end of the bear market. And I think we're uh, back in a bull market, not straight up, a lot of volatility, but I think uh, the, the markets are telling us yeah. that the world economy is improving. And you know, Torsten Slack moments ago at Apollo brings up the heart of it, the calculus, which you studied at Yale a few years ago. And the basic idea here is we've been fixated on the level of inflation Right. And now the market and the pundits and economists like you are switching to the first and second derivatives, the change of the movement, the dynamics of inflation. How does the Correct. Fed adapt to that focus and that change? Well, I, I think the Fed uh, recognizes and is embarrassed by the fact that they made a mistake at the end of 2021 and early 22, uh, that they uh, turned out to fall way behind the inflation curve. And I think they're trying to uh, make up for that mistake by possibly making another mistake. But uh, look, I don't uh, tell the Fed what to do. I try to anticipate what they're going to do. And right now, it certainly looks like they're going to do another 75 basis points, maybe in 25 basis points increments in the first half of the year, uh, even <clears throat> though the data may suggest that that's really not necessary. And then they intend to keep it there at five and right. five, five and a quarter percent. Um I have no problems with that, really. I, I think the economy is resilient. I, I, I'd i love to go well, that's back a, to the, That's the to point the here. You know, Ed, you're, you know, in your yeah. ute, Ed, we face this. So if we get up into the fivest range, and the key phrase from you, uh, Dr. Yadeni, is, and we stay there, there's a lot of punditry that the world will come to an end as we know it. <laughs> Push against that. Well, that's that's, that's not my... My style. I, I, I rarely think that the world's going to come to an end. And quite the opposite, when I see a lot of people talking that way, my contrary instincts come out. And <laughs> I, I think that uh, we may actually be uh, seeing a change from the uh, new normal of unconventional monetary policies, uh, ultra easy monetary policies that we had from 2009 to 2021. Uh, back to the old normal. Uh, I, I it would be great if we could get back to kind of uh, an environment where interest rates are not zero, uh, where we don't have uh, monetary policy uh, buying bonds in bulk. Uh, and I think that's what we're what we're we're seeing. The, we're going back to the the old normal economy, which is able to grow with uh, reasonably uh, with reasonable interest rates. Zero is not a reasonable interest rate. And if that's the case then that raises leadership questions. Where do you think that leadership comes from, both from a, a sector perspective and a geographic perspective as well? Well, uh, I, I think that uh, investors right now are, are in fact turning more optimistic about the global economy and they're looking for where values are still relatively cheap. And so we've already had a big run in China and now they're looking at, at Europe. Uh, I think it's uh, a diversified global portfolio makes sense here. I think the U.S. is going to do just fine. And uh, the leadership, I think, in the U.S. is going to be industrials uh, because there's so much money in the fiscal stimulus pipeline for infrastructure and semiconductor plants. And I think we also have onshoring. I'm looking at data showing manufacturing uh, structures, building of manufacturing structures is, is at an all-time record high in the mm -hmm. U.S. 
Let's so turn it all together, and um, yeah. you know, I, I think you just diversify. What does trade do, Ed Yardeni? X minus M, given a Chinese recovery, what is the export dynamics and the import dynamics? Well, you know, where everybody t is talking about onshoring and production moving out of China back to the United States, or at least to Mexico and Vietnam. Um, the reality is the world hasn't changed that radically in the past couple of years. Uh, if the U.S. economy is actually going to uh, have no landing th this year, which which I think is a, a plausible case, uh, I would say that uh, it's it's included in the probabilities of soft landing, which I put at 60 percent. We can have no landing, and if wow. we have no landing and the consumer continues to spend, that would uh, increase our trade deficit. Amazing how quickly this conversation has changed. Just to remind everyone, it's January 11th. And we're already questioning. We're deep into 2023. View. It's amazing. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research taking the other side of things mm. right now. You know the consensus, first half ugly, second half recovery. And all of a sudden we're talking about first half better, second half who knows. Uh, you know, you know, I hate to do this, John. You don't need to hear it. But the fact is, years ago, young Pharaoh said maybe the New Year's outlook ought to be written March 31st. They should be. <laughs> this is like trophy-taking <laughs> year uh, for that. It, it has been for us, folks, with all the different resources our team has the last 72 hours. If they ever push you this. and I out, if everyone gets fed up of us and we start up our own research house, Tom, well, we're going to do our annual outlook you know, in March and look back on the last three months and say what everyone was wrong December about. We would emphasize December 31, and we would emphasize March 31. <laughs> Is that what we would do? Yeah, you okay. know, it's like I'm waiting for spring training. I learned today the Red Sox don't have a shortstop and a second baseman. That's a small so matter. So what's happening with you guys? What's happening with I you guys? I don't know the backstory. Uh, I got my own theories, which are just amateur time, but certainly uh, the pros, and I give great credit to The Athletic for their coverage with The New York Times, the Athletic has made very clear you line up X number of teams, the Red Sox at number one, number two, number three. Have the, Mets, the, boat. Have the Mets been throwing more money at it? You know, talk to Bramo. I mean, she's like, call her up. She's on, She's a Morristown on the runway. You know, We've got to find out out. what's going on with those airlines. So here's you the know, latest for you. And, and, just to run through things, if you're just tuning in, U.S. flights grounded after the failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the FAA. That's the Federal Aviation Administration. We heard from United a little bit earlier this morning, temporarily grounding all flights to all destinations. Destinations. This is what we heard from the FAA a little bit earlier this morning, their latest update. The FAA is still working to fully restore the notice to air mission system following an outage. While some functions are beginning to come back online, national airspace system operations remain limited. That's the latest update. Here's an update from the Transport Secretary. Buttigieg, Tom, has this to say. I've been in touch with the FAA this morning about an outage affecting a key system, providing safety information to pilots. FAA is working to resolve this issue swiftly and safely so that air traffic can resume normal operations and will continue to provide updates. So, Tom, that guy's been a busy man, hasn't he, in the last couple of weeks? It's First Southwestern, and, now and this. They came out of the pandemic and they got a lot of aid and they're trying to get back to normal. They're not there yet. It's a year out. Guy Johnson joining us next to break down. Those, those more what than the two going of us on. I think that's fair Guy to say. Guy is like tuned into this. Just a little bit. Future's up two tenths. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, as we've been reporting here on surveillance, there's been a major disruption to air travel in the U.S. this morning. It's due to the failure of a key pilot notification system that's operated by the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, United Airlines has temporarily grounded all flights. Overall, one tracking website listed more than 1,100 flights delayed in the U.S. The FAA isn't eliminating how long, yes, estimating how long it will take to get that system back on track. Well, President Biden says he was surprised that classified documents were discovered in an office he used before he was elected. He says his lawyers did the right thing by calling the National Archives, which took possession of the papers the next day. Congressional Republicans are promising to investigate. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is vowing that his troops will stop Russian aggression. And he promises the conflict will not turn into World War III. Zelensky spoke by video to Tuesday night's Golden Globe ceremony. He said the tide is turning in the war, even though it's still not over. In the UK, ambulance workers are on strike again. Members of the two unions are walking out as part of a dispute of pay in the National Health Service. The public's been warned they may have to wait longer for emergency services. And after years of scandals and multi-billion dollar losses, Credit Suisse is tightening its belt. 
Bloomberg has learned the Swiss lender is considering cutting the bonus pool for 2022 by about half. Now, that move would bring the amount down to about $1 billion, with some employees likely to receive no bonus at all for the last year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The entirety of 2022, we were asked, when's the capitulation? When's the sure. catharsis? When's the emotion? It's coming. You've got so much stock of consumer savings. And in that environment, one might be able to argue that you're going to have, I wouldn't say a soft landing, but not a crash to call it over 5% in the unemployment rate. And so you're still going to have uh, that backstop that gets you through the shallow recession to the recovery of 24. Julian Emanuel there of Evercore, almost sounded constructive. He still thinks the lows are in our future and not in our past in this equity market from New York. Good morning to you. Here's your equity market right now. Equity futures shaping up as follows. Going into CPI tomorrow morning, the inflation report in America just around the corner. Equities up by a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields are lower by four basis points on a 10-year, 357.79. Our attention this morning on the airlines in America after the failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the Federal Aviation Administration. As I've mentioned a few times this morning, we heard from United Airlines in the last hour, temporarily grounding flights to all destinations. The stocks are a little bit softer. United's down by 7 tenths of 1%. Southwest off the lows, still lower by 1.4%. The latest update from the Federal Aviation Administration, Tom reads as follows out on Twitter. The FAA is still working to fully restore the notice to wear mission system following an outage. They go on to say, while some functions are beginning to come back online, national airspace system operations remain limited. And TK, that's your latest, basically. Yeah, I'm an expert on this. I went to the FAA site and started to dive in and read. And the answer is it's a very tight, tight system of communication of the thousands of airplanes that are in the sky. It's not, you know, landing at Newark and I need to get to my gate and, you know, I got to get across runway, whiskey, whiskey, whiskey. It's not that. It's you're up in the air and where's everybody else? Just to be clear here, whiskey, whiskey, whiskey is not the phonetic alphabet. That's just a shot of whiskey, a shot of whiskey. <laughs> I, th I thought that's what they said. They'd say, you know, tango this, yeah. whiskey that. <laughs> I've seen you at the airport. Should we talk to somebody I who think knows you probably should do that pretty quickly. About? Let's talk to somebody actually informative here. Guy Johnson joins us right now out of London. <laughs> Guy, you follow this industry. Walk us through what you're learning. It's O for Orangina. Um, look, as you say, you just laid out the, the, the latest. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that we can get any more uh, in terms of information as to where we stand right now, other than what you just laid out from the FAA. Yeah, this is a mission-critical <clears throat> communication system between pilots. This is safety. This is hazards. Uh, this is the stuff you really need to know, yeah. and, and it's very time-sensitive, Tom. So when this goes down, it is a major problem, which is why you've seen the ground stops uh, at various airlines. It will take a long time to get the system back up and running. It went out last night. They're beginning to bring it back very slowly. But the effects of this will last for many hours beyond the system coming back as yeah. well, because clearly now we have aeroplanes in the wrong place, chaos across the, uh, across the uh, system, uh, and that's going to yeah. take a while. I wouldn't have wanted to be the person that had to wake up the Southwest management this morning and tell them that we have yet another problem. Guy, just a general question for all of our listeners and viewers concerned. And, you know, I, I can make jokes about it, folks, but this is serious stuff. Guy, I was coming into Heathrow once over the Fulham field, and there must have been a plane going from Gaddock up to Edinburgh. It went by us, a thousand feet below us, going straight due north up to Scotland or whatever. I mean, I mean, to those of us that don't have your knowledge, is the integrity of these systems rock solid? I mean, there's essentially there's never any crashes, right? Well, there are crashes. They try and avoid them. Um, generally, in-flight, in, in sort of mid-air collisions um, are, are probably a bad thing, and you want to avoid those. So, yes, yeah. the systems are are fairly uh, are, are good. They could be better, Tom. And this is this is something that Europe is certainly that. working on. You, you at the moment have a. It, it is not. It could be significantly... Aviation has been asking for a more um, sophisticated air traffic system for a very long time in Europe. 
It is part of the green agenda. If you can make the system more sophisticated, you can fly aircraft closer together, you can fly them on better routes, you can do all kinds of things. So you, there is a big kind of environmental impact here. There's a big, a big sort of safety update as well uh, around all of that too. The systems are good, the systems are very good, uh, but they could always be better. And, and this is where you could potentially see some significant investment over the next few years. But the other question, uh, Tom, that I would be asking this morning would be, how vulnerable is US infrastructure? How vulnerable is European infrastructure? That is a big question that I think a lot of people will be asking themselves once again. How sophisticated is the security around some of these systems? I'm in no way suggesting uh, that this is anything other than a system failure, um, but it could be at some point in the future caused by something else. And I think mm. that will be a question that once again, people will be asking themselves. Guy, just getting another update from the FAA. This in a tweet just moments ago, the third update from them. The FAA has ordered airlines to pause all domestic departures until 9 a.m. Eastern time. It's 7.22 right now to allow the agency to validate the integrity of flight and safety information. Uh, Guy, what do you make of that? It is taking a long time to get this system back up. My understanding, John, is that this went down at around 8 o'clock last night, that they've had problems since then. I can't confirm that, but I have seen that suggested. It is taking a long time to get this system back up and running. But as I said a moment ago, John, this is a, this is a critical safety communication tool. It has to work. To Tom's point, this stuff has to work or bad things happen. They will want to make sure that it is fully functional, that everybody is up to speed, that uh, given, given the confusion that there will now be, you are kind of loading extra into the system as well to make sure that everything is and can proceed in a safe manner. And I think they, the FAA will be very, very careful on this stuff. But the problem then is that this is a critical part of the morning. We're midweek. A lot of flights are leaving. A lot of aircraft are going to be in the wrong place. A lot of passengers are going to be in the wrong place. There, it is going to take a long time for the effects of this to be fully felt throughout the system. So, yes, it may take until 9am for the system to come back up, but yep. the effects of this will be felt for much longer. A lot of staff are going to be in the wrong place as well, Guy. We saw how that affected South West in the last couple of weeks. Guy, you mentioned yep. infrastructure. We heard from the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, just moments ago out on Twitter. Here's the update from him. He says, I've been in touch with the FAA this morning about an outage effect in a key system providing safety information to pilots. He went on to say the FAA is working to resolve this issue swiftly and safely so that air traffic can and resume normal operations. He'll continue to provide updates for us. Guy, can you just walk us through the amount of infrastructure spend we actually need in the United States in this particular sector? Well, you, you, talk to, you talk to Mr Kirby at United, you talk to all of the airline bosses, they will tell you that air traffic control has been one of the big limiting factors in the United States in its ability to ramp back up to pre-pandemic levels of, of, um, tr of transport and sort of aviation more broadly. Uh, I'm including cargo and everything like that in this. So, so there has been a huge problem with air traffic control ATC in the United States. Just having the capacity to be able to move all the flights safely in the way that everybody wants remains, remains difficult. So yes, there needs to be significant infrastructure spending in this area, both in the United States and in Europe, but it can come with big benefits as well. You will not see aircraft being queued up. Aircraft standing on the ground, burning jet fuel, is an area that you could improve really quite significantly. Routings could improve. Uh, you are going to be burning less jet fuel as a result of that. The system could be significantly more efficient and the system could be significantly safer. This is an area on both sides of the Atlantic that needs spending and the airlines have been calling for it in the United States it is definitely an air traffic control system uh, issue uh, that has limited capacity. In Europe, it's been more kind of ground handling and things like that. But both, both continents are in need of significant, uh, significant spending in this area. You could, you could spend a lot upgrading it. This is an area that has not been digitised in the way that other areas have. Hey, Guy, fantastic to catch up. Thank you, sir. Guy Johnson there of Bloomberg. The latest from the FAA. The US FAA told airlines to pause all domestic departures until 9 a.m. Eastern time to allow it to, quote, validate the integrity of flight and safety information. That tweet, TK, come in just moments ago. Well, it's a timeline at the 9 a.m., but the message there from somebody who actually knows what he's talking about is it extends way beyond that. You've got to get pilots from point A to B to C, all the staffing, the luggage and the rest of it. So it's not just a 9 a.m. moment that this all gets back to normal. I don't buy that for a minute. It is 7.25 in New York. Coming up, Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab.
Pretty steady price action going into inflation tomorrow morning. Equity futures look like this on the S&P, up a little more than a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq 100 right now. Virtually unchanged, up by 0.05% in the bond market to start the year. A rally at the front end of the curve. The two-year yield is lower. It's lower again today by a basis point or two on a two-year right now at 4.23. Just to round things up for you in the FX market, euro dollar shaping up as follows. Talked a lot about that Goldman call from yesterday dropping their call for a eurozone recession euro dollar right now 107.32 going absolutely nowhere we've had a ton of ecb speak the latest from the austrian central bank governor who suggested only softer core inflation can shift the ecb on rate hikes we've had not had that just yet from the ecb from the eurozone we've had headline inflation a little bit softer but core inflation looking very Mm. Very sticky. That's the market. Let's get you up to speed on some of the price action in the pre-market for the equity story. Single names we look to one sector right now. It's the airlines. Airlines are a little bit softer. American down by eight or nine tenths of one percent. United down by a half of one percent. The latest on that front, U.S. flights grounded, disrupted this morning after a key pilot notification system operated by the FAA broke down. The latest update we've had from the FAA is the following, and this is the third update we've had so far this morning. They've been very active on Twitter, if you want to follow that. The latest tweet, the FAA ordered airlines to pause all domestic departures until 9 Eastern time. It's 7.31 Eastern right now. So 9 Eastern time, the FAA has ordered airlines to pause all domestic departures until then to allow, quote, Tom, the agency to validate the integrity of flight and safety information. So hugely disrupted disruptive well, to domestic flights this morning. And the pilots have limited working hours, very, very strict laws on what they can spend on the ground and in the air, and I don't have them in front of me. I've actually personally experienced that, as I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners have. And so if I have a 7 a.m. flight from wherever, and i got to wait two hours or three hours to get up and, and all that, you wonder what the length of day of the pilot is, and are they going to be able to fly that airplane, even if the airplane can fly? Well, I said it. Everything starts to end up yeah. in the wrong place pretty quickly. <clears throat> right. And even if you get a disruption that lasts two, three hours, maybe it goes to 9 Eastern. Let's say it does mm -hmm. end at 9 Eastern. Tommy can take a long, long yeah. time to unravel the mess. Can we frame some data right now? Of course you can. I know you're going to talk important inflation talk into Kathy Jones. We need to remember, folks, that the real yield, and I expect that you should watch the real yield here weekly, uh, the property of John Farrow. The inflation-adjusted yield, John, is 1.35% by the metric I use. We are nowhere near pre-pandemic, even pre-GFC, real yield. We are now getting distant from where Chairman Powell would like to be on the inflation-adjusted yield. You really think this easing of financial conditions is problematic? Thank you for this Federal Reserve. It's not the outcome they want. People hinge it back to the labor market. I think we've got a number of fixed income strategists that have been really, really good about the assumed linkages here. How linkage how linkagey are the linkages? Linkage yes. Okay, nice. The latest you. Fed speak came from Michelle Bowman. CFA level four. Fed governor had this to say. In recent months, we've seen a decline in some measures of inflation, but we have a lot more work to do. I expect the FOMC will continue raising interest rates to tighten monetary policy, as we stated after our December meeting. <clears throat> Tom, they are not changing their view. They're no. not changing their Why view. They're they? saying the same thing again and again and again. But this market stopped responding to it in quite the same way it was. Uh, well, you know, Tuesday we'll see this and there'll be Fed speak. And then when's the Fed meeting? Is it February 1? I February 1. Remember. February 1. Starts at the end of this month. I mean, we get meeting. a lot of clarity here, February 1. And, you know, we're going to move on in that five-ish range. And then what? And, of course, that's what keeps the show uh, going. One of the great supporters of what we do is Kathy Jones. She's chief fixed income strategist at Charles Schwab. Kathy, let me cut to the retail chase. Is this a year to clip a coupon? Or dare I say, can I find total return? No, well, I think you'll get both. I think you'll get some total return. Uh, we've been suggesting extending duration since yields at the long end hit about 4% in the anticipation that you will get um, some capital gain going forward. Uh, and you, But you have to be sort of intermediate to longer term duration to, to get that. I think the short end is a little bit rich right now relative to where the Fed wants to go. But when you look at longer term, um, yields, you, that's where you have the room for the capital appreciation. So the tighter the Fed is for longer, and this is something we've been talking about for a long time, the more it presses down the long-term inflation expectations right. and the better it is for intermediate to long-term yields. What are people doing at Schwab? If I'm in bonds and I've enjoyed a capital loss, 
Are they sticking it out? Are they in cash? Dare I suggest they're switching, say, to equities? Oh, they're doing everything. I know we have a huge uh, client base, so we have a lot of people doing a lot of different things. I, I think what we have started to see just recently is some moving out the curve. So we have a lot of people in cash. I wouldn't say there's been a big shift to equities that I can perceive. And in fact, inflows into fixed income have been very strong over the last couple of months and yields have moved up. Um, but a lot of people still a little bit reluctant to go out the curve and take on more duration risk. We're starting to see that as volatility has settled down a little bit and it's become a little bit more clear that inflation is coming down. But I think there's still some, some more to go on that. There's certainly a lot of reluctance amongst investors to take on more duration risk until they feel confident. That, that we're near the peak in Fed funds rate. Well, Kathy, let's just breathe a little bit more life into the story at the long end. If people believe there are reasons to send equities in emerging markets back into a bull market, <clears> to send <throat> copper back through 9,000, to send European banks up 40% since the lows of the summer, why aren't those same reasons a reason to send bond yields much higher? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's one of the, one of the emerging conundrums in the market right now that you've seen these sort of, um, sort of risk on trades take off and yet you haven't seen longer term bond yields shift very much. In fact, they're towards the lows. You know, I guess, and I can only guess because I don't trade equities, uh, <laughs> emerging market equities in particular, so I, I won't say what the idea there is, but we have this combination of sort of a soft landing in the global economy. The worst case scenario didn't happen uh, because natural gas prices in Europe came down because, you know, it's warmer, uh, energy prices have come down. So that's really lifted some of the growth prospects there. And of course, China's reopening. So you have this combination of growth prospects improving, but central banks tightening to keep inflation down. And I'm, I think there's a push pull here at some point, and we're going to have to see which side is really going to win this fight. Um, I still believe that we have enough central bank tightening cumulatively in the system that uh, growth globally has got to stay pretty soft longer term. Well, Kathy, do you think we could get some divergence here, some real decoupling between regions experiencing different things at different times? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the first time in a long time that international bonds are starting to look attractive. You know, the dollar has come down. And um, the Fed has been ahead of the cycle, uh, ahead of other central banks uh, in tightening. So that could mean that we start to see, you know, inflation abate here, yield peak here, and, and dollar looks like it's peaked for a while. So that could mean that we get um, better yields uh, opportunities elsewhere as we go forward uh, into 2023. So we could see some divergence, right. but limited because keep in mind, all the central banks in the developed yeah. world are still hiking rates. Kathy, we're going to have to run to FAA headlines. John's watching that very closely here. But I just want to tell you that when Chuck Schwab tells you you can have a piano in your office at Charles Schwab, by those of you in radio, Ms. Jones has such power shot. I mean, I, I mean, Liz Ann Saunders doesn't have this. She'd have, you know, a Les Paul or something. But we got the Kathy Jones piano, John, in the office at Schwab. It's, it, it, it's, it's a keyboard, and I'm not in the office. <laughs> Oh, okay, but well, I just was suggesting it wasn't what the grand. What are you trying to start here? What are you trying to start? I, I just think, you know, surveillance, you know, to turn over here to the White Falcon or, you know. I can't it, believe it, you even noticed that. I couldn't see that. I can see it now. Well, but you know, she's got, she's got clout. That. I mean, you know, Schwab walks by and he goes, play me some Rachmaninoff. And she's you think that's it. how it goes down over Yeah, that's what happens I think there. Kathy wants to run. Kathy, thank you. As always, just brilliant. Kathy Jones at Charles Schwab, thank you very much. An update from individual airlines. And Tom. this is important because you called a nothing tweet, and that's the mystery here as we wait for 9 a.m. Well, this is all we've got from American Airlines. The Federal Aviation Administration is experiencing a nationwide system outage that affects all airlines. We're closely monitoring the situation and working with the FAA to minimize customer disruptions. Now, if you're tuning in and wondering what this means for you, well, this is all we know from the FAA. The FAA has told airlines to pause all domestic departures until 9 a.m. Eastern time. And, Tom, what the team are trying to find out and get some clarity on, yeah. does this apply to international flights as well? Do they fly into Montreal? I don't know. 
you know, I don't transatlantic. Know I, you know, you go to Nova Scotia and turn right and fly over the Montreal Forum and wave. I can only share with you the language that we're getting from the FAA right now. And the latest update, this was the third update of the morning. The FAA has ordered airlines to pause all domestic departures until 9 a.m. Eastern time to allow the agency to validate the integrity of flight and safety information. If you are just tuning in on TV and radio, what we had a little bit earlier this morning was an announcement of a failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the FAA that has disrupted air travel throughout the United States this morning. I have to say disruptive for travellers but not maybe disruptive for the equities. If you look at the stock of the pre-market, they're not massive moves. No, I think I, the price action I, suggests I, I, that I this will be temporary, Tom, and we'll get yeah, through it. At least that's yeah. what the price action suggests so far. And, uh, and maybe it's a good study. I've been looking out, and the FAA, of course, has huge plans, uh, as any government institution does, to get us out five years, out ten years. I thought Guy Johnson's comment there on one constraint are the flight controllers. You're not doing flight... Con I mean, I listen to him at Newark. You know, I sit in the manse. I go, you know, it's a little low. The walk-up where I am, John, it's a little low to really be in tune with Newark flight control. But <laughs> the answer is I listen to them sometimes when it doesn't break up. And, you know, this is real intense stuff still. I mean, flight controllers are doing what they did 30 years ago. Do you want the latest from BA? British Airways, Lufthansa. <laughs> They're on top of it. Say operations not <clears throat> affected. Not affected. There might be some of you out there thinking about what's behind this breakdown of this notification system. Here's a tweet that we're getting from the press secretary. The president has been briefed by the Secretary of Transportation this morning on the FAA system outage. There is no evidence of a cyber attack at this point, but the president directed DOT, Department of Transportation, to conduct a full investigation into the causes. The FAA will provide regular updates. There will be those questions asked, Tom, this morning as this yeah, carries on. Yeah, they, they will as, as well. i got flight aware up here and I'm looking at uh, the very limited flights into JFK and uh, you know, well, I, I can't read it. The, the text is so small I can't read it. It looks like LAX is Well, this is helpful. In. Yeah, it is. I think <laughs> LAX is coming into JFK right now. they got to land. And so there's a lot of that going on but then they don't take off. Equity futures right now up two tenths of one percent. We'll keep you up to speed on that developing story through this morning. The latest that we have from the FAA is that domestic flights, I keep saying that, domestic flights will be grounded until 9 a.m. Eastern Time. up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo well as you've been hearing there's a major disruption to air travel in the u.s this morning the federal aviation administration has ordered domestic airlines to halt all domestic departures until 9 a.m new york time now that's due to failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the agency the faa says it's working to quote validate the integrity of flight and safety information in California now, more drenching rain on the way as a historic drought gives way to flooding. Three more storms are set to hit the state through the weekend. Since the end of December, storms have killed at least 15 people, closed highways, and sent residents fleeing for their lives. Wells Fargo has announced a new strategic direction for a mortgage empire that once was the largest in U.S. banking. It will stop funding home loans arranged by outsiders and shrink the portfolio of debts it services. That caps years of efforts to clean up a business that entangled Wells Fargo in regulatory probes and lawsuits. Shares of luxury goods company LVMH hit a record high today. The company named new CEOs at two of its brands, Louis Vuitton and Christian Dior. The, the Dior chief is Delphine Arnault. She's the daughter of LVMH CEO Bernard Arnault. LVMH already is up 13% this year. And at the Golden Globe, Steven Spielberg was a big winner. The veteran Hollywood filmmaker won Best Director for The Fablemans, which is based on his life. The film won the Golden Globe for Best Drama. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
last year was a complicated year in, uh, in, in Europe and we obviously would want that this war ends in the year that, uh, that comes. But indeed, if you look at the, the economic indicators, um, indeed, uh, the fear for recession is, is diminishing. Um, and there are good reasons for that. I think, first of all, the agreement on the gas price cap was a necessary one and which we push for a lot and, and, and is a strong indication that in Europe we will not pay these very high prices anymore. The market has just become so accustomed to the Fed ringing the bell. The market is probably incorrect in believing that there's going to be any sort of material easing in 2023. Right now, it's ignoring some of the hawkishness from both the ECB and from the Fed. The messaging certainly this week has been more hawkish. The Fed wants to go to restrictive and hold. I mean, that's sort of the definition of how you could get into a deeper downturn. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, nationwide. We welcome you. Interesting day with an economics, finance, investment to the inflation report tomorrow. But now it is a nation still. The planes are on the ground. John, we're hearing more now. The linkage of the White House to the Secretary of Transportation to a beleaguered FAA. Well, let's take it from the top. So we've had this failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, which has disrupted travel all morning. The latest that we hear from the FAA, Tom, is that US flights are being halted until 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. This according to the FAA in a bulletin. The last tweet we had from them read as follows, that the FAA has ordered airlines to pause all domestic departures to allow the agency to validate the integrity of flight and safety information. As for the president, I think a lot of people, Tom, want to understand the cause. The president said the FAA expects in a few hours to have a sense, sense of, of the cause. cause. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I don't know where to go with that, frankly. And there's a lot of snarky stuff out on Twitter right now. We don't need to do that. What I would look at, folks, is the speed of Twitter and these institutions that are on Twitter. And, John, the one that I just saw there was 39 minutes ago. We sort of had radio silence from FAA in the last half hour. Well, we're hearing from the president, Tom, and this is what we heard from the press secretary in the last hour, too. Just on that possibility, the potential that this was a cyber attack, they addressed that directly. There is no evidence of a cyber attack at this point, but the president directed DOT to conduct a full investigation sure. into the causes. I imagine we'll get that question a few times, Tom, throughout the day. It will be there, and to review this for our international audience, international airlines, uh, John, can I use this language, are being accepted into American airports. I think that's I'll safe borrow to the say. president's language. Flights can land, they can't take off. That's yeah. what he said. Yeah. Okay, I'll go with that. We saw that. I was looking at Flight Aware, and we had LAX coming into JFK as just one example uh, of that uh, right now. I want to do a data check here. We'll keep you up to date on what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of verbiage out of the administration right now. Futures advance up 10, Dow futures up 70. The VIX is my major story. 22 yesterday with a good market yesterday coming in 20.73. And, John, to me, the singular feature to our SuperCore uh, Thursday uh, is the accommodation of now a tenth of a percentage point, 0 0.10 above zero, a positive statistic on the Bloomberg Financial Conditions uh, Index. This has been an extraordinary and many would say unpredictable move. So let's take the 10 year, 358. We're something <clears throat> like 80 basis points below the highs of last year on a 10 year yield. The two year a couple of months ago was pushing 480 at one point. 480, I think that's the intraday high, 479 or something like that in the last year. Right now, 425. So we've come back in. We've come back in in the face of all this hawkish talk from the Federal Reserve. This market, yeah. in some ways, Thomas, stop listening. Let's pause now. And again, we're waiting to see here. Uh, this is, uh, Blaine, uh, US, UK aviation unaffected by failure of U.S. pilot system. They've got their own strikes over there, but I guess the <laughs> FAA doesn't fold into what's going on at Heathrow. That's the government spokesperson, <clears throat> Tom, with the latest headline, the aviation unaffected in the U.K. by the failure of that pilot system. As I say, the latest, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, yeah. all domestic airlines. Yeah. All airlines have been told no domestic departures, Tom, until such time. We're going to get to Sarah Malik here with Naveen John. We've got to review China. What we just heard from Mr. Malpass at the World Bank from Freya Beamish earlier as well. Mr. Malpass is an institutional guy. Can't get out front of this as we're seeing selected firms. No, but he would acknowledge the upside risk to his outlook for China. 
So okay. go through it one by one. I think for the United States, he's at 0.5 GDP growth for this year. I think for the Eurozone, he's at something like zero. And for China, it's in the low fours. Now compare the low fours to Morgan Stanley, which is looking for something in a fine <coughs> handle maybe. Or for that matter, Evercore. Julian Emanuel sat in that chair yesterday. 6.2. Yeah. So clearly he acknowledges there is some upside risk now to their China outlook. And I would say, Tom, and I've said this a few times this morning, you can take the GDP outlook for them, the World Bank with a one handle, compare and contrast that to the price action of the last couple of months. In EM, in emerging markets, Tom, in Eurozone banks, in the commodity market, you copper back you, through 9K. You mentioned continental European banks, moonshot off the bottom. Uh, more than 40% since the summer yeah. lows. That's yeah. a massive move. And have a look at high yield spreads domestically in the United States. It's not screaming recession right now. They are tighter yeah. than they were just a few months ago by almost 100 basis points plus. Stay with us, our team in New York and London monitoring the news here on Aviation. We'll bring you all those headlines. Right now, Sarah Malik joins us now, Chief Investment Officer at Naveen. Thrilled she could uh, be patient as we go over the aviation uh, moment. Sarah, what's your confidence in your outlook? I would suggest certitude or confidence has been shattered in the 10 days of January. Well, markets and the Fed disagree on the outlook, but we expect markets to tread water until we get to two events this week, and that's CPI and earnings. Now, whispers are for CPI to be better than expected. We expect moderate growth as we see that continued shift from goods to services, lower auto prices, but consumers still keep spending. But is that enough to get the Fed to change their course? I don't think so. We still will see a long tail of a pause in interest rate hikes and also a long tail of inflation. And then secondarily is earnings. What I am pleased to see is that earnings growth is expected to be flat for this quarter, and we are seeing margins decline. But revenue growth is still positive for the year. So right. the question is, if we go into a economic slowdown, revenue growth probably can't stay positive. And market valuations are pricing in a very optimistic scenario. And that's what makes me concerned about the rest of 2023. How do you allocate now? What is the gross allocation? I mean, the Nuveen heritage is fixed income. But what is the allocation you choose to have right now? It is fixed income over equities because I think what you can get is more traditional equity like returns in fixed income for lower volatility. A lot of that rate hike pain is priced into fixed income. I'm worried about equity earnings. I think they're still too high. We've not seen the impact of tight, tighter monetary policy on earnings, on margins, and on that positive revenue growth that probably isn't sustainable. So I think fixed income looks better, take on a little bit more duration and risk there, and you can get high single digit to low double digit returns in quality areas like investment grade and municipal bonds. Is Sarah, are you more concerned about earnings in one sector over another, or is this pretty broad based, pretty widespread? I think it could be widespread depending on the depth of the recession. If you look at earnings this year, it looks kind of similar to last year with energy leading and technology at the bottom. I think there's interesting areas within technology where you could see stronger earnings as we start to go through the cycle, the areas that are less cyclical. I still like software here. I think semiconductors could hit an inflection point this year. Uh, kicking off later this week will be financials. That's an area that we're not incredibly positive on because of the capital's markets risk for these large banks. I like the regional banks over the large banks. They're more protected and away from capital markets issues. Sarah, there's this massive cyclical story emerging off the back of China reopening, and Tom and I have been talking about it all morning. I'd love your view on it. You've got a commodity market yeah. rallying, base metals, copper through 9,000. You've got EM equities back in a bull market. We talked about Europe at the top of the hour. European banks up more than 40% since the summer lows. They believe in this cyclical story at least relative to where we were several months ago. And Sarah, I'm wondering why that's not showing up at the long end in the bond market. Everyone's saying, let's take on duration. Let's look for those lower yields. But XUS, this market right now is not screaming recession. I think short term, you're going to get a rebound in a lot of these areas because of China reopening. I'd have questions over long term, the real economic growth of China and where we get to. Once we get past this bounce, China was kind of a sprung coil that it had you know, very poor returns for the last couple of years. And then finally, it started to pick up recently. Um, also, commodities, though, have another story, which is renewable energy. The amount of demand for areas such as copper and cobalt and nickel is also being driven as we shift to using more and more renewable energy. I expect the demand for copper to actually double by the year 2035. And if you look at the um, supply of copper, even in the US, we've been cutting supply for the last 25 years. So there's another metal story that's important. Energy has its own fundamentals. Demand has been strong for energy for a while. Supply has been tight. Our peak investment in energy was 2014. Producers are focusing on returning cash to shareholders. So the energy fundamental story remains strong with or without China. So that's a structural story. Can we just sit on the cyclical one a little bit longer? This is the question at the moment for us. 
Should we be pricing in a growth rebound off the back of China reopening or a growth slowdown off the back of all the tightening we've seen? Which one is it? I think that what I'm most worried about is the impact of tightening. You're getting right into the period where we're starting to see what this aggressive increase in rate hikes around the world does to the economy. I'm more worried about that and what that does versus China, which I think is, is a shorter term play, shorter term rebound as they get back to normal. But the overhanging main event of the year is going to be what amount of damage have global central banks done to the economy. Uh, what's holding us up here? It's the consumer and it's the employment markets. We're already seeing the consumer dip into their saving rates to keep spending. Uh, employment markets have not cracked yet, but if the consumer and the employment markets crack, I think that then is the recession story that you get and the unwind in revenue growth. And that would have told us that market valuations are too high right now. Sarah Malik and Nuveen. Sarah, thank you. Just brilliant. As always, Sarah Malik there of Nuveen. So, Tom, a lot of people are on the other side of this. They believe that this could just be a bear market rally abroad and that what we're seeing right now is a head fake encouraged by this China reopening story. It's there. It's there. And, and I go back to the tried and true. And it's not that I believe or disbelieve in this. Nobody cares what I think. But the bottom line is everyone's out there looking for this catharsis, a VIX to 40, a VIX to 30. That's what Julian was talking or, about. Yeah. And there's, that's a widely held thought. I don't have a strong opinion on that. What I'm looking at is the elephant in the room, China's reopening. And that's in every research note, including Ms. Malik. Ben Emmons published this moments ago. What did Ben say? He just, he just says, look, it's about China and a global reopening, and everybody's recalibrating right now. Do you think we can reopen the skies in America, the latest from the FAA? <clears throat> you have something new? Just before 8 o'clock, that was our last update, really, 15 minutes ago. U.S. flights being halted until 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. That from the FAA, Tom, in a bulletin. I, I, I don't know what to say other than Twitter is a very powerful thing with all the uproar uh, recently. And the answer is you follow the FAA. They seem to be very good, John, about putting out the knowledge that they have. But, you know, put yourself in their position. They don't want to open up and then, oops, oh, of course. shut down again. Well, we they talked about be it. This, this industry, for yeah. good reason, is incredibly risk averse. Yeah. And no one wants to see them rush into this. I said it was highly disruptive for passengers this morning. Not so much for the individual stocks in the pre-market. Not moving, moving much yeah. at all. Equity futures up a third of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo well as we've been reporting there's a number of major disruptions to air travel across the u.s this morning the federal aviation administration ordered airlines to stop all domestic de departures until 9 30 a.m new york time after a key pilot information system failed the agency says technicians are trying to restore operations it said that some systems had started to come back before it ordered a halt to departures President Biden says he was surprised that classified documents were discovered in an office he used before he was elected. He says his lawyers did the right thing by calling the National Archives, which took possession of the papers the next day. Congressional Republicans are promising to investigate. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is vowing that his troops will stop Russian aggression. And he promises the conflict will not turn into World War III. Zelensky spoke by video to Tuesday night's Golden Globe ceremony. He said the tide is turning in the war, even though it's still not over. Mortgage rates in the U.S. have dropped for the first time in three weeks. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the rate for a 30-year loan fell 16 basis points to just over 6.4 percent last week. That helped boost applications for refinancing, which rose 5.1 percent. And after years of scandals and multi-billion dollar losses, Credit Suisse is tightening its belt. Bloomberg has learned the Swiss lender is considering cutting the bonus pool for 2022 by about half. That move would bring the amount down to about $1 billion, with some employees likely to receive no bonus at all for last year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're in the process at home, and you are as well. We've talked about it, strengthening our supply chains so that 
No one can arbitrarily hold us up or a pandemic in Asia cause us to not have access to critical elements that we need to do everything from build automobiles to so many other things. That's the President of the United States. The latest on air travel this morning. A little bit earlier on, we had a failure of a key pilot notification system operated by the Federal Aviation Administration that led to the grounding of many planes across the United <clears throat> States of America, unable to depart for domestic flights. This is the latest update from the FAA this morning, making progress in restoring its notice-to-air mission system following an overnight outage. Departures are resuming at Newark and at Atlanta airport as well due to air traffic congestion in those areas. We expect departures to resume at other airports at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Tom, that's the latest. In addition to that, yeah. just confirming what you and I discussed a little bit earlier, all flights currently in the sky are safe to land. I don't know Atlanta that well, John, but I'm very conversant with the EWR, and it's literally where do you put the planes on the ground? They're like opposite of JFK. There's not a lot of acreage there. So I wonder if the air traffic congestion is the quote, if that's get the planes. They just got to get the planes off the ground. What caused it? That's going to be the next question. Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. The president said it a little bit earlier that, that the FAA expects in a few hours to have a sense of <clears> cause. <throat> we heard from the press secretary a little bit earlier this morning that addressed one of those questions directly and said there's no evidence of a cyber attack at this point. But we'll wait, Tom, for an update on that. Can you see it on Twitter again where the FAA, it seems to be their flow here. The uh, press secretary 37 minutes ago and the FAA three minutes ago and now one minute ago on the tweet that John just uh, mentioned. We'll look for those continued updates. And we are ever so fortunate. When the news moves, it is always good to speak to the gentleman from Arkansas. French Hill uh, has been a good friend of this show in explaining his view on Washington policy. And he has a nodding acquaintance with the FAA. French, I want to go back five years ago, and you played local domestic politics by getting the FAA to commit to Little Rock and to commit to aviation away from what we talk about, which is Atlantic, Newark, JFK, and, and LAX as well. What is your confidence in the funding of the FAA right now? Are they underfunded, on target, or do we need to step it up? <clears throat> well, Tom, John, good to be with you. I think the FAA has had robust funding. I think people know that we have the finest air traffic control system in the world, so I have no doubt they'll get to the bottom of this. <clears throat> and if they need assistance from either the executive branch or Congress, they'll be the first to speak up about it. We've had a great relationship in Little Rock with the FAA in helping us expand uh, economic development by working with our airport and changing uh, the location of their air traffic control cones. So, look, I've got a great relationship with them, and we right. stand by to help if we need to. I'll see how we get through the morning. You're trying to get through January, French Hill, as a Republican, trying to get to February 1st. Our guests, and even within Bloomberg Surveillance French, there is a serious mystery to what we observed in a small group of Republicans versus an embedded GOP in the House. Describe right now the nascent relationship between the speaker, grizzled veterans like you, and the crew we heard from front and center a number of days ago. Yeah, it was a tumultuous week last week. It took 15 ballots to elect Kevin McCarthy the speaker, and that set a historic uh, record in the, in the recent modern history. But look, all along the way, Tom, there was a lot of attention to that 19 to 21 members who were holding out. But what about the 200 people that were consistently there saying Kevin McCarthy is the best choice for speaker? And for many of them, he's the only choice for speaker. So that's what carried us through the week. And I'll say this, I think a lot has been made about what concessions did Kevin McCarthy right. give in order to become speaker. And in my view, they were not as dramatic as some of the news media coverage that I've seen. Do you know those concessions? Even this morning, there seems to be a mystery. I saw one relatively expert pundit say, look, it's all going to leak out eventually. Is French Hill aware of what those, those, myst those mysterious concessions are? Yeah, I am. I was one of uh, Mr. McCarthy's negotiators last week uh, with the holdout group. And <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, the, uh, the agreement surrounds three things. First, the rules package, which there was only one change to the rules package that had already been approved by members of Congress on the Republican side. And that was the vacate the chair motion, a motion that's been in place since 1910. All speakers have faced a vacate the chair motion except for Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The second topic was uh, the budget. 
How do we control spending after the pandemic and after the Joe Biden spending spree? How do we go back to basic principles and reduce the budget deficit? And then the third and final category of things that we agreed to were to make sure that every voice in our Republican conference is represented on a committee. And that was essentially right. it. There is no secret agreement, and everything that I'm aware of in that agreement has been made uh, public in our conference meetings or by press reports. Congressman Hill, I would suggest respectfully that, yes, there's been a Biden spending spree, but there was a Trump spending spree, and before that, another spree, and we're spree, spree, spree back decades. We're trying to find a rational fiscal path for this nation. Can that be as bipartisan as our actions on China? Boy, it needs to be, Tom, and I think you make a very good point. Look, the baseline for the Congressional Budget Office says we're going to have one and a half trillion dollar deficits for the next 10 years under those principal spending measures that Joe Biden authorized and asked for in the last two years. And it has been made worse. And I want to go back to the time where Republicans and Democrats both agreed yes. that budget deficits were bad. Well, okay, well, stop. We're bad. I, I've got just some, yeah. a little bit of time left, French. How do we get back? to Scoop Jackson and HHH actually talking to Republicans? Well, we have a group, uh, I think our new budget committee chairman, Jody Arrington of West Texas, has got a group of 30 Republicans and 30 Democrats that are working on how do we get back to budget sanity. And I think that's a smart way to do it is have those individual visits. Congressman, we have to go, Tom. We have to go? We have to go. We have yeah, to let's go? get into the interview. I want to ask him about back. Georgia football. Is it like Alabama? You want to squeeze that in, all right? Okay, go on. French Hill, this is really important. I mean, we know Arkansas exactly. is going to reign supreme. But just simple now, is Georgia the new Alabama in football? Boy, don't tell anybody from Alabama that. But everybody <laughs> had a red coat on here from Georgia. Y'all have a great day. French Hill, thank you so much. Congressman, thank you. Just want to keep everyone up to speed sure, on the latest with the FAA. This could be over in the next hour or so. The FAA making progress in restoring its notice-to-air mission system following an overnight outage. Departures resuming at Newark over in New Jersey and Atlanta Airport due to air traffic congestion in those areas. We expect departures to resume at other airports at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So, Tom, that's about 36 minutes from where we are right now. It's really good news. And, you know, I, I take the point, as Guy Johnson mentioned, that it's going to take a while to undo this. But, you know, I, I haven't seen this out anywhere, but by 12 noon, is it all clear? East Coast time? Possibly. It could take longer than that to clear things up, Tom. Yeah. Get planes in the right places, get staff in the right places. Hugely disruptive for people today, but as we've said repeatedly, Can not we... very disruptive for the airline stocks themselves through most of this morning in the pre-market. May I editorialize? Um, I don't think you need my permission. <laughs> what a shock here. Can I just suggest, folks, with all this uproar over crypto and Musk and Twitter, this is what Twitter's about. This, oh, is the this is where people go for power news. of Twitter. Do you know what the problem is, though? And let me give you an example as a journalist reporting on this right now. So we got those tweets from the FAA. And Tom, for the first time in a long time, I was nervous about using a verified account on Twitter. Yes. Unsure as to whether I that was actually the FAA. Yeah. And that is a problem about the new verification system. Over at Twitter, I, it's confusing for a lot of people. I, in the strongest terms, agree, and that's some of this damage that we've seen in the last number of weeks. There's like a blue little tag, like the FAA, and there's orange tags and yellow tags, and I, I'm confused by I it I think all. a lot of people are. Yeah. That's problematic, and that will take some time to clear up. We'll see how this works yeah. out, Tom. Still only yeah. a couple of months in to his tenure. It, the year's out. already long, is what I would well, suggest. Well, let's give it a year. You know, let's see how we are on the other side of this. 2022 is exhausting. He's got his own pressures, and lucky for him, I guess, it's no longer a publicly traded company. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You can make a different yeah. decision set yeah. with a private company, although I will say he's got his own market pressures, and we've discussed them. Yeah. I... I'm done. I'm going to run. All right? Yeah, OK. you got to get ready for 9 o'clock. Yeah, I mean, Victoria an Fernandez across Who do you have? Michael Cushman and Morgan Stanley. Very good. Very cool, just on this bond market. Very good. This was fun. See you tomorrow. OK, we'll see you tomorrow. You know. Future's up 14. Good morning.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning across this nation on radio, on television. Most interesting, John Farrell getting ready for his 9 o'clock hour. Lisa Abramowitz is off today. And, of course, we have a national moment with a shutdown of the FAA. Planes grounded across America. But a relatively good stream of good news over the last number of minutes. We're monitoring the major communication uh, that we've seen from FAA. And that is Twitter. 14 minutes ago is the last comment that we saw the FAA making progress progress in restoring the N O A M the N O T A M rather their their monitoring system for planes in the sky departures resuming at Newark at Atlanta Due to air traffic congestion in these areas, they expect departures to resume at 9 a.m., and that's maybe a little bit different than the 9.30 tone that we had a half an hour ago. This story is very active. We'll interrupt to bring you an update on this international flights landing uh, in the United States. Futures up 13, Dow futures up 87. Nice lift to the market. I'm seeing it with a further accommodative policy. And now we need to blend in here the economics with the markets. And we can do that with Lorena Yerucci, U.S. economist at T. Rowe Price. And she has lived at the London School of Economics. They, when you're there, graduate or undergraduate, you have to observe the Phillips machine, which is a strange linkage of employment with inflation going back just after World War II, now ensconced in a gorgeous museum in London. Lorena, you're, you're, your quality here, is the Phillips curve still in place? for Chairman Powell? That trade-off between inflation and the U.S. labor market is always going to be in place. Sometimes statistical relationships can go upside down, but I think that link between the tightness of the labor market mm -hmm. and how that affects consumer prices, it's, it's there. And I think we're seeing that because throughout last year we had an extreme tightness in U.S. labor markets, a lot of vacancies, not enough workers to fill those jobs. And we saw how that affected consumer prices. Are you, it. Are you advising portfolio managers at T. Rowe Price that finally the employment market will break, that we will see higher unemployment rate? I think that's down the line for the U.S. economy, but not just yet. And I'm observing a very interesting dynamic right now, Please. a real conflict be between the ISM and survey data and the PMIs that say a recession is imminent. And then the labor market that is uh, pointing to a deceleration, but not a dramatic one and saying the recession dynamics may set in place in the U.S., but that's going to be further down the line. And really what I'm watching in U.S. labor market data right now, it's temporary help. That's a very, very pro-cyclical component of the U.S. labor market. Uh, it's the, let's say, the release valve for employers. If demand is slowing, that's the first workers uh, to be let go. And that has already started to, to cool. And I think that's a, a step in the right direction if we're worried about tightness in U.S. labor market. If you're at a buy-side shop managing major institutional money, we've seen here within the punditry of financial media this shift from recession, doom and gloom to literally in six, eight, 10 days, the opening of China and accommodation. How do you handle that shift advising people running such stodgy money? Well, I think if you are a big institutional investor, you cannot, you have to keep your eye on the trend and have conviction about where you see the economy going in three, six, 12 months. And the way we're seeing things right now, when I look at consensus, I see pricing of a Goldilocks scenario. Markets are expecting a 50 basis point cut from the Fed by the end of this year. I don't think that's telling us that the market has strong conviction in a recession because this is not how the Fed will uh, react in a recession. So when I'm thinking about the consensus picture, I think perhaps for uh, the end of 2023, uh, risks actually are to the downside to the consensus. And then the key uh, is the timing. And for me, the timing, timing a re U.S. recession is always about the consumer and the labor market. What is the value of inflation right now? We have what I've, I've been joking, super core inflation Thursday and tomorrow. We're down to the silliness of parsing out parts of inflation. Even Chairman Powell has brought up services X this, X that. Do you buy it or do you look at the aggregate numbers? Well, I'm all about disaggregating. I, I grew up creating my inflation forecast at the very detailed data. I think 
and level. I think that matters a lot for the near term. And I buy this story because we have to understand some inflation components are very idiosyncratic and some of them have a lot of inertia like rent and, and shelter overall. So for instance, I think it's very important to look at core services ex shelter. That's down to 1% three month annualized from a peak of 13% last summer. So I think inflation momentum right. is slowing. It's just that we need to see this on a more sustained basis. And, and for the Fed, that has been burned so badly with a transitory story. I think it makes so much no. sense to be hawkish for for a while. But I think when they do make that dovish pivot, it's going to be very quick. Uh, this is something, folks, and I'm going to have to continue with this because I'm with Blarina. I disaggregate inflation and get yelled at by uh, any number of people. That it should be one big aggregate statistic. Blarina, you're rich here with us with T. Rowe at Price. We continue to monitor the airplanes on the ground across America right now. No recent news from the Federal uh, Aviation Administration here 16 minutes ago is what we see in the latest tweet, if you will, the communication from the FAA. 9.30 was a number bandied about even an hour ago. We shift that to 9 o'clock with some form of departures in Atlanta and at Newark, uh, just to the west of New York City in uh, New Jersey. We continue with Blarina uh, uh, Arucci uh, right now. Blarina, I love the idea of disaggregating inflation. But can you disaggregate housing? Can you repeat that question for me, please? Oh, I'm I sorry. Hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to leave Blarina. Uh, Matt, would you want to? Okay, we're going to continue with Blarina right now. Blarina, can you, dis can you take housing out of the inflation dynamic as a separate pandemic beast? I think you can, and I think you should right now, because it's really driven by what happened in the uh, U.S. housing market. We had a big bubble in U.S. housing, and we also didn't overbuild or didn't build enough uh, relative to demand. And there are some transitions happening right now where housing became so expensive and unaffordable that more people rented. And also we had a big geographic shift from the metro areas to smaller metro areas or suburbia. And all of that put the right. housing market and rent prices in hiatus. I think we're due for a normalization. I expect that to happen uh, by the end of Q2 of this year. And at that point, overall, it will slow significantly. Okay. Blarina, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate that with T. Rowe at Price. Most interesting as we go to that inflation report tomorrow. In our universe of 19,000 Bloomberg employees, you try to find someone that knows the FAA cold. We've tracked on Alan Levin in Washington, who is truly expert on FAA aviation safety and their systems as well. Alan, I'm going to play the dummy. You play the smart guy. When you hear this news, I'll try. is it just a software collapse or do you suggest it's more than a software malfunction? Well, at this stage, uh, the folks at FAA don't really know exactly what caused it, we're told. Um, we're also hearing that from the White House as well. Um, but so that, uh, and they also say there's no indication that this is some sort of a cyber attack or something like that. Um, you know, uh, historically, FAA's uh, technology systems were fairly fragile, but in recent years, they've gotten a lot better. So uh, this is a little bit of a surprise, and it, it is one of the worst uh, outages they've had in recent decades. Their software, I mean, we talk about the Pentagon using Fortran cards, folks, IBM cards from another time and place into the modern age. Would you suggest that the budgeting and the software computer build at the FAA is modern or is it dated? Uh, I would say it's largely modern. Uh, there was a time uh, a decade or two ago when the FAA was using some rather old technology and and in their defense you know they, they can't just uh, turn off the right. system for a month and rebuild it they have to keep it running and all the functionality has to be at a super high level uh, but, but I would say you know they have updated uh, up and down their systems in the past 10 20 years um, gone to you know better uh, mm -hmm. uh, communication lines, newer digital radio systems, the whole thing. So 
uh, it, it's relatively uh, updated, I would say. Would you suggest, Alan, this is really your forte here, is on the politics of the FAA. I can't believe I'm saying this, but is it political or do they have a bipartisan support in Congress for their budget requests? Uh, there are always, uh, uh, you know, uh, partisan issues that come up with the FAA, but by and large, it's one of the more bipartisan committee. The two committees that handle FAA are among the most bipartisan, and uh, you know, there's enough of a national interest to maintain the air traffic system, mm -hmm. et cetera, that it uh, is typically not right. political. What is your number one question this morning as you begin the Washington Day? Folks, the Washington Day at Bloomberg begins about 9.30. Ellen will slide into the office about 9.30, unlike up here in early morning New York. Alan, when you slide into the office today, what's your number one curiosity about your FAA? Well, we're just trying to figure out um, what might have caused this. Is there an underlying flaw in the system? Was there a cyber attack? Though that doesn't appear to be the case, no, we, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so, so, and and then what the impacts are going to be? The it, it they're already talking about resuming service at some of the busier airports, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so you know, uh, this has been a huge impact this morning, but it it could turn around pretty quickly and end up being less of a impact on travelers right. than the big meltdown we saw during Christmas. On short notice, Alan Levin, thank you so much for interrupting your morning here in FAA crisis. He is with Bloomberg News and our expert on airline safety uh, in America. Futures up 12, Dow Futures up 83. John Farrell and I are steeled for Supercore Thursday. Claims, yes, but an important inflation report that we see uh, tomorrow. We'll have conversation across Bloomberg television and radio all through today on the guesstimates, the dynamics of this inflation call should point out a burgeoning China as well. David Rubenstein, peer to beer conversation, the gentleman from Carlisle in conversation tonight. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Bignett Mateo. As you'll be hearing here on surveillance, airline departures across the U.S. are slowly starting to resume. After a major disruption, the Federal Aviation Administration says flights are getting back on track at airports in Atlanta and Newark. The FAA had halted departures nationwide after a key pilot information system failed. Now, the White House says there is no evidence that that failure was caused by a cyber attack. Bloomberg's learned that Tesla is close to sealing a preliminary deal to set up a factory in Indonesia. That would allow Elon Musk's electric car maker to capitalize on the country's reserves of metals used in batteries. The plant would produce as many as one million cars a year. Wells Fargo has announced a new strategic direction for a mortgage empire that once was the largest in U.S. banking. It will stop funding home loans arranged by outsiders and shrink the portfolio of debts and services. That caps years of efforts to clean up a business that entangled Wells Fargo in regulatory probes and lawsuits. Shares of luxury goods company LVMH hit a record high today. The company named new CEOs at two of its brands, Louis Vuitton and Christian Dior. The Dior chief is Delphine Arnaud. Now, she's the daughter of LVMH CEO Bernard Arnaud. LVMH is already up 13 percent this year. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think today, probably 80% of Congress, uh, maybe 70, 80% understands the basics and they understand the potential of this technology that it has, it has a lot of innovation potential, which we want to preserve, but it also has some risks. And unfortunately, it's attracted some, some bad actors to try to come into this industry to try to profit from it. And so they recognize the balance, the need for both clear regulation and preserving that innovation potential.
He is Brian Armstrong of Coinbase, and this is very interesting. Tonight at 9 p.m., if you care about crypto, this is truly must listen. He is the chairman, the CEO, the co-founder of Coinbase, and far more importantly, he has mentioned Brad Actors. By all accounts, he is literally the good actor uh, in uh, in uh, Bitcoin land, in Coinbase land, in crypto land as well. We're watching what's going on with the FAA. No real news here. Southwest Airlines uh, mentioning uh, their services need schedule adjustments. But other than that, we await the FAA. As we near that 9 a.m. Uh, point, some confusion. We are at 9.30, and now we're back to 9 a.m. Maybe in the next 12 minutes here in uh, New York, we'll get some further information. David Rubenstein joins us now with Carlisle. And, of course, host of Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations with a really important conversation made more important by the news flow in the Coinbase world. David, this kid is from Palo Alto. This kid is from engineering. He took one of the great double degrees in America, Rice University, economics and game theory, did all the right things, and his company is now falling apart. Well, I wouldn't say it's falling apart. The company is publicly traded. It did have a market cap that's probably about 90% uh, above what it is today. But the company has real revenue. Uh, the company is laying off some people. It's laying off 20% of its workforce. It previously laid off 18%. But the company is regulated by the U.S. government. The company um, is a very large uh, uh, company that, does with, that, that deals with uh, trading of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and it has a real business, has real revenue, and it seems to be doing the opposite of what FTX did. It doesn't trade for its own account. It doesn't have its own coin that or token that it's created. So it's much different than, than FTX. Unfortunately, it's been hurt by the FTX uh, challenges. What is your take on this, then, as you talk to Brian in the news flow and the concentration that I as an amateur see with Binance as well? Does he have a strategic ability to recover? Is there a Coinbase difference because of uh, Mr. Armstrong? Well, Brian is a very smart person. As you pointed out, he's, he's an engineer. His parents uh, were engineers as well and, and involved in computer software. He really is a very, very smart, highly focused person. He's built a very good company, but is now caught in a maelstrom, maelstrom of, of the, the problems of FTX. But I think his company is one that that really does have real revenue. It does serve a real purpose. If you want to buy a cryptocurrency, you can do it through his company, and it's regulated by the U.S. government. It's a publicly traded company. Now, the stock has gone down a fair bit, but that's not unexpected. Mm -hmm. A lot of technology companies have gone down, and obviously a lot of crypto companies have gone down as well. David, did he speak of his future about his linkage to the underlying? I'm going to use the price of Bitcoin there from 50, 60,000 on down to a present 17,000. How critical is the price of Bitcoin for its operational path forward? I don't think the price of Bitcoin is as important as the volume. Having people go in and trade, whether price is higher or lower, is probably not as relevant to him. Just like the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, he's basically providing an exchange where people can buy cryptocurrencies. And it seems to be, uh, you know, well run. It clearly, right now, uh, he's now reducing headcount because volume is down a bit. Uh, but I don't think it's a company that's just going to fall mm -hmm. apart. Um, it's much different than FTX. What is the opportunistic moment here for private investors such as Carlisle? I don't need you to give me the family jewels. But in this chaos, is there crypto opportunity? Well, uh, Carlisle is not a buyer of crypto-related companies, but I would say generally, uh, the technology market is down 30 or 40 percent, um, some of the leading companies in, from its, their peak. And therefore, if you are a value investor or if you want to buy some things cheap, now is probably a pretty good time. The best time to buy things, obviously, is when there's blood in the streets, as they say. And right now, in the technology world, there has been blood in the streets, and the crypto world has even been worse. But I think if you're a value investor and you look, really look at uh, buying things cheaply now is probably a pretty good time to invest in the tech world. David Rubenstein, I must take a moment here with critical headlines. FAA, nine minutes make it 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Federal Aviation Administration says normal air traffic operations are resuming gradually across the United States. The ground stop 
has been lifted. That just moments ago uh, from the FAA. We'll look for follow-up on that as well. David, you have public service in Washington. How is the FAA treated in Washington? I mean, it's not the Pentagon. It's not the State Department. But, boy, is it something we use each and every day. Well, the FAA um, doesn't get as much money as it probably would like. And the system of, of air traffic control, which is different than the one we're talking about today, the overall air traffic control system, has taken a long time to, to fix and make more modern. So I think the FAA uh, could use a lot more support from Congress, a lot more support uh, generally from the public in terms of its need to modernize what it does. Remember the moment, David, years ago where President Reagan made a splash by standing up to union members up in towers trying to get us to land our planes? Are we scarred, still star scarred from that moment 40-some years ago where Ronald Reagan said to the flight controllers, no, you know, we're not going to back down? Well, Tom, you and I might be the only people old enough <laughs> to remember that, but that happened in the early 1980s when uh, there was a strike at the... Yeah. Uh, at the air traffic controllers, and, and President Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers. The system continued to work. Um, that system uh, is now still dated a bit, and we could use mm -hmm. modernization. But I don't see any strike in the, in the mm -hmm. imminent future, and I think that the way Ronald Reagan handled it probably dealt with that problem for quite some time. David, one final question and a statement, I guess, on the shift that we've seen at Bloomberg Surveillance just in the last four or five days. Do you and Carlisle, with all your re resources, do you believe in a Chinese recovery to 5 or 6 percent GDP, a, a renaissance of the Pacific Rim post-pandemic? I think it's a mistake to bet against the Chinese economy. 5 or 6 percent would be high growth because um, it's recovering, obviously, from the COVID situation. But I think counting out the Chinese economy is always a mistake. <clears throat> and I think people who have underestimated the Chinese economy over the last 30 years have generally found out that they were wrong. David, thank you so much. This is going to be important. When they filmed this with Mr. Armstrong, it was supposed to be important, but now it is ever more important. David Rubenstein with Brian Armstrong of Coinbase tonight. That will be at 9 p.m. And, of course, crypto on Bloomberg will also follow through on this uh, in their interior reporting and, of course, the next Tuesday as well when they broadcast. It'll be a whole new world after that. I'd like to spend some time on radio and TV on the market dynamics that we see as we see a lifting of the drama this morning from the FAA. The FAA here before 9 a.m. says they have a ground lift. I'll let you describe what that is. Look it up if you want. Normal air traffic uh, efforts resume. It is update five. They have communicated by Twitter. Thank you, Mr. Musk. Normal air traffic operations resuming gradually across the United States following overnight outage of their system. It provides safety for the flight crews, as Mr. Rubenstein mentioned, that distinction. The ground stop has been uh, lifted, and boy, will they continue to look at this. As French Hill of Arkansas uh, said, this is a well-funded staff, but boy, this has been a shock, and we thank our uh, Alan Levin, truly our expert here at Bloomberg on air safety, for his comments uh, as well. He made very, very clear the, the enormity, the gravity of what we have seen uh, this morning. In the data, we look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, and it's real simple. You've got yields coming in a solid five basis point, 3.57 on the 10-year yield. This within accommodation. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index is out to recovery highs, more accommodation and a positive statistic. And again, futures in the equity markets show that buoyancy. Uh, futures up 16, Dow futures up 110. And the VIX, with that big day yesterday, 22 down to 20 level, 20.68 uh, right now. John Farrow has been looking at foreign exchange. I'm going to call it uh, a churn in the foreign exchange market right now with sterling 12107. Uh, uh, and finally, Brent crude, and this deserves careful watching, uh, gold lifting up, not to 2000 yet, but gold uh, moving up in the commodity space with copper, gold 1882. The ounce. I don't quote LME copper. I can't find it on a Bloomberg. I'll let John do that uh, for you. But $82 on Brent crude really deserves focus here to see if we finally get oil moving with what presumes to be a Chinese opening. There is much more today and forward to this incredibly interesting inflation report that we will see tomorrow. This is important. Andrew Griffith of the United Kingdom and the financial secretary to the Treasury in the 12 noon hour, the ramifications of U.S. inflation in London. Stay with us on radio, on television. Good morning. Thank you.